Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cast. Borag Thung, Fritz, and welcome to the latest episode of the 2000 AD Thrillcast Lockdown Tapes. I am your esteemable host, Malt Jar. Uh, and this week we are chatting to former 2000 AD editor John Tomlinson. Now, uh, John was editor through uh, what is broadly considered a difficult period. 2000 AD, which was uh, the, uh, the early to mid 1990s. Now, um, by this point, there'd been quite a significant brain drain uh, with an awful lot of creators going off to America over the course of the 1980s. And there was a, a degree of experimentation. He was brought into 2000 AD, um, having uh, been an editor at Marvel UK and then a writer for 2000 AD. Um, but he was brought on um, at the time with the Summer Offensive, which was Mark Miller, Grant Morrison and John Smith basically taking over 2000 AD with um, series such as uh, Big Dave. So um, it's kind of really interesting to get to hear his perspective uh, on this. Um, he then went on to, to write series such as you know, Armageddon, um, Mercy Heights uh, before uh, moving on uh, to Pastures New. So, uh, yeah, it's really fascinating chat with him um, about uh, quite a controversial period in 2080s history. So uh, we'll crack on with that in a second. Uh, in the meantime, uh, don't forget to go along to 2080.com forward slash news for all the latest announcements about 2080. What's out this week? Well, um, there's the pre-order for uh, the next volume of Lawless by Dan Abnett and Phil Winslade. We've got the Time Flies digital only uh, collection, which is um, Garth Ennis and Philip Bond's time traveling. But speaking about the 90s, it's a, a time traveling comedy series from the 1990s. Um, and uh, there's uh, plenty of stuff coming up, such as um, Alex DeCampi's Full Tilt Boogie with art by uh, Eduardo Osana. So uh, it's going to be a busy May from the galaxy's greatest comic. Um, so we'll bring you more. Uh, from uh, the creators who are putting it together. Um, obviously, there's going to be more regimes this month. And uh, I think next month we're due a jumping on issue for 2000 AD. So, uh, yeah, keep them busy. We're going to have a chat with John Tomlinson now. It's uh, quite a long chat, but um, we kind of cover the full gamut of his, uh, of his uh, career um, from starting out through to uh, the period of uh, working for 2080, including the first Judge Dredd movie, which is very interesting, uh, and uh, beyond into his uh, latest career. So, uh, yeah, without much further ado, let's hear from John Tomlinson. Many thanks for this, John. Uh, we uh, hand you on... Uh, briefly as part of the uh, magazine anniversary editors get together. Um, yes, I was the nodding head at the bottom of the screen, <laughs> having only really edited the magazine for about six issues, felt like about six weeks. Uh, and I thought, well, don't, don't butt in unless you have something to say. But uh, that, that turned out to be uh, distressingly little. Well, I mean, we, we, we'll, we'll kind of talk about the, uh, that, that period because I, I think it, even though the, the, the kind of crossover time where um, you, you you were working on the Meg uh, was brief. I think it, it's it's illustrative of a really interesting period in in, in two thousand uh, history. But I I, I I want to focus on you first. I because you 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 started off in comics at Marvel UK, I believe. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us a little bit about your your background and how you came to uh, to, to to be at Marvel. Because it, it, even in the eighties, um, when there was slightly more. Uh, Kind of day jobs editing comics in the UK than there they are necessarily now. Um, it was it was quite a different mm -hmm. landscape back then, wasn't it? Well, it, it was, and it was. Uh, I, I don't know. It, was all, it, it felt a bit like a hand to mouth existence. I mean, I I, uh, I was wanted to get into comics, and um, and I went to I, I studied graphic design at, um, at De Montfort University in, uh, in in Leicester, and um, and I I always thought that would lead ultimately into. Um, you know, career drawing comics because I, mean, I used to, to, to draw comics uh, for, for fun all the time when I was a kid. 
And I'd always written stories for fun as well, but, uh, you know, it never occurred to me that I might be able to do anything with that. But there was, um, the second year of that course, there was, um, they did a, a placement and uh, you could go in and spend a, a month or two weeks, whatever, at a design studio, which, you know, being graphic design course was what most people did. But, you know, I thought, well, this, this is my big chance to get to work in comics. So I, uh, uh, I wrote to IBC, uh, DC Thompson at Marvel UK, and uh, Marvel were actually the only ones who responded, which I was secretly pleased about because, you know, that, that was kind of where I wanted to go anyway. So I, I went down there for two weeks for uh, what turned into into a month, really, because they were slightly short staffed. And, uh, you know, clearly I hadn't completely disgraced myself in the two weeks I had there. And uh, so they asked me to stay on for a bit. And, um, and it was, uh, I mean, a really nice bunch of people, but it was a very small outfit, very small company in a real kind of ramshackle building. And, uh, you know, Marvel's up on the top two floors, and uh, apart from Starburst magazine and Doctor Who magazine, which were in the basement. And, you know, they, they rarely emerged from the basement either. They were like, like Morlocks. Everyone had this, this kind of prison pallet. And on the ground floor, there was, um, there was a burger bar, um, uh, Rose and Ron's Burger Bar. And so the, the whole building stank of fried onions all day. And uh, But they, um, you know, because I, you know, I didn't own, but certainly least the, the ground floor, they used to um, lock the door at a certain point. So if you wanted to leave work, <clears throat> excuse me, after a certain time, you, uh, you had to go up to the top floor, um, out the back entrance, down a fire escape and sort of and out through the car park. And, uh, so it was, uh, but I mean, at the time I thought that was great. I thought, well, this, this is how Spider-Man gets around. You know, I'm really at Marvel. So, so it was, um, you know, I just had a great time um, working there. And, uh, you know, I, I can be completed my uh, course, got my degree, but, uh, you know, I immediately, because you know, some of my friends were coming down to London anyway, and I immediately wrote to Marvel saying, you know, have you got anything, um, anything more permanent? And and they did. So they um, they invited me back down. And almost um, coincidentally, I know it was meant to be. I don't know. Um, I got a um, call from some old mates of mine from college who were after an extra person to share a flat with. So uh, it all kind of dovetailed nicely within about two weeks. And uh, I, I started at Marvel UK. And that was... Uh, and that was in um, Kentish Town, uh, Jadwin House in Kentish Town, which is where Marvel UK, you know, it's start one of the earliest places they worked anyway. And uh, uh, yeah, so I was, I was there for five years in in total, and just just kind of um, learning the job as I went along. I, they they started me off answering letters on the you know the the Spider Man letters page, and I kind of I got all my old Marvel comics out and I was trying to answer them in a, in a Stan Lee tone of voice, and you know, if they could make it sound authentically Marvel-like. And I was kind of, you know, laying out the page as well and picking illustrations or doing little bits of drawing here and there. So it was uh, it was a bit like going out to play. And it was, it was a fantastic um, first job. And, uh, you know, I, became, I studied graph design, so I became a designer. Oh, that's, that's the other thing as well. I mean, I'd always um, wanted to be a comics artist, but I think what kind of put, put paid to it was when I saw um, some of the, the actual um, art. I mean, the, the first um, bit of artwork I saw was a, um, an episode of Absalom Dark by, by Steve Dillon, who was, I mean, he was only a teenager at the time. He looked like someone who'd been drawing for 30 years. It was, it was amazing. And all rendered in this kind of, he penciled and inked it as well. And, uh, you know, with this, this beautiful uh, brushwork. And, um, it was just a work of art. And I, you know, I, I brought in this portfolio full of um, dreadful, scratchy um, rotary pen illustrations of um, Orion from New Gods and uh, Spider Man and so on. I kind of uh, discreetly stuffed those out of sight and uh, thought, well, well, okay, maybe one day, but, you know, for now, well, just let's get on with what I can actually do. And, um, so that, that was Marvel UK, but um, uh, but by the way, uh, feel free to to butt any 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 time you feel I've delighted you enough. You know, I have a tendency to, to ramble. No, no, no. As I as I always say, rambling is good. Rambling is good. Um, we I, I, I'm interested about Marvel UK because um, in the 1970s, uh, you, the, the the two opposing poles of the comic book industry in the UK were were IPC in London and and DC Thompson up in them. Um, uh, Dundee and Marvel UK was was mostly uh, reprint material. It was repackaging um, the, the 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 American stuff. Uh, and and then uh, through the eighties, you get this big blossoming of the um, of all the licensed comics. You know the the because uh, I, I you know my first comic book was um, Marvel UK's Transformers. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, that was a massive hit for, for Marley Cage. It was selling as much as 2000 AD at one time. And, uh, you know, that that because uh, it was bringing in so much money, it meant that uh, we'd afford to do um, a regular weekly um, originated strip as well. So I kind of, that, that Transformers was what really got Marvel UK off the ground in terms of originated artwork that was produced in England. I mean, um, Captain Britain was uh, was all written, uh, drawn, put together, and um, you know all the production stuff was uh, w- w- was put together in the uh, the US offices. It was uh, you know, written by Chris Claremont, who had some very distant connection with the UK, and drawn by. Um, Herb Trimp and um, but it was it was kind of I know it was a kind of strange hybrid of um, Spider Man and Captain Britain you know I don't think it really ever um, uh, found its own identity until Dave Thorpe and Alan Davis and eventually of course Alan Moore took it over and his costume was revamped and uh, you know that was uh, that was all in the eighties um, but but yeah I mean Transformers was what kicked it all off really um, edited by Ian Rimmer who was um, uh, he'd been the editor of Scream at um, IPC. Um, before he started the Marley UK, Simon Furman, who was, you know, he, he, he is Transformers as far as anyone's concerned. He was Ian's uh, deputy editor on Scream, so he joined shortly afterwards. And uh, and it was that really that started the uh, the, the, the ball rolling for uh, for all the um, original stuff at Marley UK. Is it, it- while while uh, 2008 has often been, um, I think I once described it as, as a conversation Britain has about itself, but using the vocabulary of America uh, mm-hmm. so often. Uh, Marvel UK as a as, as a transatlantic entity um, was it was it kind of. Uh, <laughs> This isn't meant to sound in any way derogatory. Was it? Was it kind of? Take, <laughs> was, was it just taking orders from the states and then go? Well, what can we do with this? Because you know, in the, in the nineteen nineties, you th- you had things like Overkill, obviously, which um, mm. was um, the, the the kind of originated material. It was like Motormouth and Digitech and, and Knights of Pendragon and Warheads and whatnot. Um, so it, it it feels as if um, there was a, a tension there about, as you say, you know, getting its own identity making things that actually uh, were transatlantic and that they spoke the language of, of American superhero comics but had their own identity as, as, as British made? Well, it, it, it was a very uh, deliberate thing, yes. And, um, and it wasn't... Um, um, I mean, it, it was at the behest of Marvel. I mean, it, it came about, I think, because uh, Zoids, which had been a, you know, a modest hit as a, as a weekly or perhaps a fortnightly for, for Marvel UK, and it features some of the earliest work by um, Grant Morrison and uh, Steve Yole um, working together. And, uh, you know, that looked like it might, you know, actually have potential as, a, as, as an American format title. So uh, um, Grant Morrison had written a few issues. Steve uh, Yole had, had drawn um, them the, the first issue and it was looking great. And we were you know, really looking forward to it coming out. But then what happened was that um, Tom DeFalco came over from, uh, from all the US and, um, and he looked at it, and because you know, knowing that it was going to be our first US format comic to launch in the in the states, looked at it and uh, said, "Well, yeah, this is okay, but this is not really what what we do." I mean, I can't. I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember exactly what he said. So that kind of uh, you know, m- much of everyone's uh, you know, huge disappointment um, bit the dust and uh, and has never been seen. And um, R- Richard Starkings once said, "I don't know if he ever did, but he said, look, I, I would let her hold that first issue for free, you know, just just to get it out because it's such a good story, and you know." No one's ever going to get to see it, so you know. I, I hope it's um, one day available somewhere. But um, no, I mean, we um, the, the the first um, American format Marvel UK comic that actually launched in the states, and I'm hoping getting this right because a long time ago now was uh, um, it was either Dragon's Claws or Death's Head. I think it was Dragon's Claws that came first, um, written by Simon, um, drawn by Jeff, and it was uh, Jeff Senior who drew most of the. And Transformers strips from Marvel UK, and it was a, an attempt to get that kind of Transformers sensibility into an American comic. And uh, you know, I mean, Simon was um, a huge fan of Marvel, and uh, you know, Marvel's act was he kind of he knew what was necessary to uh, attract an American audience. And um, I mean, it did it did modest business. Death's Head, I think, did slightly better. And then. The, the third one, which is a real kind of wild card, which is more around um, Richard Starkings' kind of um, um, pet project, was uh, Sleaze Brothers. Um, and that was uh, the brainchild of John Carnell, who's a writer, and Andy Lanning, who you know needs no introduction. And um, 
they'd uh, they'd been like a, a, a regular team on Marvel's Ghostbusters, real Ghostbusters title. They'd got to know everyone in the office, are really good friends with uh, with Richard, and they kind of um, evolved Sleaze Brothers between them. And um, and that was the third one. And, uh, I mean, I, I never saw any sales figures. I think, uh, you know, they were a reasonably big critical hit. I mean, they weren't uh, like massive blockbusters in terms of sales, but they did okay, and they got Marvel UK on the map for uh, for American audiences. And, you know, everyone was very pleased, and we thought we'd, uh, we, you know, far from embarrassing ourselves, we, we thought we'd done a nice job. And in terms of, of, of your role at, at Marvel UK, you know, as somebody who had uh, essentially been there as an intern, <laughs> um, and then it's come to where they, what, you know, you, you've already mentioned doing the the letters page. Was this, you know, fully fledged editorial? You know, commissioning strips. Uh, putting them together. Well, it was, yeah. Eventually, yeah. My my first ed- editorial job was um, as uh, editor of Thundercats, which was also um, a big hit for Marvel. I mean, it didn't do. Um, Transformers kind of business, but you know, it did very well for a long time, and uh, you know, that was my first um, chance to, to 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 get a a grip. Actually, you no, know, it, um, it it came came about after I, I sort of got headhunted by uh, by Fleetway, weirdly enough, and um, they, they're about to launch a new title. It's called, I think it was the this. I think it was called The Supernaturals. I can't remember now because there have been so many things with that or similar titles since. And um, so I got called in for an interview with, uh, with, with Gil Page, who was uh, one of the managing editors there at the time. And, um, and he kind of told me all about it. And I thought, well, this is, yeah, this is my big chance to be an editor. But I also knew that Thundercats was coming up as a possibility at Marvel UK. So I... Uh, uh, you know, I thought about it and I said, uh, well, thanks very much, Gil. And uh, maybe it's some laser. I don't feel I'm quite experienced enough yet, but please, you know, keep me on the books. And um, so I went back to Marvel UK and became editor. But uh, what then happened was that Gil Page went to Richard Starkings and got him in for an interview. And um, and Richard was a bit more canny than me because, uh, you know, he, he had a very good job editing action force and, you know, various other evil plans of his own at Marvel UK. So he, you know, wasn't ready to... to jump ship either but um he came back and then went immediately went into robert sutherland's office who was a managing director and said uh, right well um i've just been headhunted by ipc fleetway you know whoever it was and uh you know they want to pay me this much money i mean again i'm paraphrasing I'm paraphrasing i'm sure none of these words ever pass his lips but he, he said you know if you want to um, if you want to hang on to me, uh, <laughs> are you going to make it worth my while? So what happened as a result of that was that not only Richard, but but I also got a, a pay rise and, uh, and we stayed at Marvel UK for a few years. So I'm eternally grateful to to, to Gil Page for that that job offer. Even though I, I didn't take it. But yeah, yeah, um, Thundercats was my first editorial job and it was mostly commissioning strips and covers and I, you know, I wrote the occasional one myself and, and tech stories and things. But yeah, it was, it was my first real kind of... Um, shot at um, working with artists and writers. I mean, it, you probably did the right thing uh, to not go with the Supernaturals job because I think that lasted about nine issues. Um, uh, well, yeah, yes, I, I didn't like to say so, but yeah, when it did come out, I uh, thought, well, okay, I, I dodged a bullet here, you know, that's far happier with Thundercats. Uh, but you never know at the time, you know, you just have to go with your instincts and uh, luckily they, they turn out to be correct in that case. What was the, the 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 culture of the time like in in terms of the comic industry? Because you know the 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 Marvel UK offices uh, obviously not not a million miles away from from where two thousand AD were. Was, was there a, a poor league at one point? I seem to recall. I'm sorry, say the last bit again. Was I'll there a, my volume up? All right. Um, was there a, a poor league at one point? I seem to recall. Um, well, there, there was, but that wasn't until, as far as I remember anyway, that wasn't until Marvel moved to, to Tunbridge Wells in the in the 90s. And yeah, I mean, I was witness to that pool league, but I uh, don't know one end of a pool queue from another. So so yeah, I, I never got involved in it. But yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was always a really sociable place. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was the only, cause, I mean, I wish I'd known at the time how rare this was, but it's, it's the only company I've ever worked for where, the, the whole uh, company, you know, design, editorial, art, accounts, marketing, even the managing director, everybody went down the pub on a Friday night and, uh, you know, generally had a really good time. A very, very few punch ups, so, you know, there, there were one or two. But no, it was um, a really kind of happy place to work. I mean, not that it wasn't without uh, its own share of kind of um, angst and infighting, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, and I think 
possibly because uh, we were all of a similar age. Um, it was it was almost like being at school. You know, it's kind of, we'd all started at more or less the same time, had very similar backgrounds, and uh, we we all got on extremely well. So it was uh, you know it was. Uh, yeah, the, the, the um, although the the pool cult, the pool league only came along later, it was just kind of an extension of that, I suppose. And even when it became Panini, it was still uh, still a friendly place to work. We we, we obviously know a lot about um, the the history of two thousand AD through things like Thrill Power Overload and, and the various books that have been written. Um, but it doesn't feel as if there's, there's there's been much in the way of that analysis of what you know happened with Marvel UK. Do you think that's just because it was a smaller outfit? There was, um, uh, and, and, and one could almost say a more commercial outfit in the, you know, you're, you're dealing with licensed properties. It's not necessarily um, the same kind of uh, property as, as uh, 2000 AD. Well, it was uh, it was always known as, as a reprint company, and for a long time it was. And uh, but when we um, worked there, and we were gradually um, originating more and more stuff, we kind of we began to take that a bit personally, and uh, you know, started to, to bash out as much original material as we could. And um, I mean. It, uh, I think until uh, the early '90s, which is when uh, Paul Neary took um, took over as uh, the the managing editor, and, and Marvel US really got behind Marvel UK in a way they never had before, and uh, it was a lot more money was uh, was suddenly available to commission new stuff. A whole line of comics, in fact, starting with 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 Deathhead. I mean, that was probably where Marvel UK really came to came into its own in terms of uh, you know new stuff and original characters, and. Uh, I mean, I think probably they uh, they launched slightly too much too soon. I mean, Death's Head was a was a terrific comic, but um, some of the uh, the others perhaps weren't, you know. And um, you know, it was. Um, I'm losing losing my thread a bit here, but. Uh, um, it, it, you know, it was. Um, I, I think uh, for me, it always comes down to the writing, and um, you know, you had Dan Abner, who was, uh, was and is uh, an extremely good um, writer, and uh, but but some of the other strips were were written by people who didn't have that much experience or background in in comics, and uh, there's only so much an editor can do to to pull things together. So. Uh, you know, I think uh, maybe um, if mistakes were made, it was they didn't get in people like uh, I know, Garth Ennis, Grant Morrison, uh, you know, Wagner and Grant, uh, better known um, writers that, um, you know, might have uh, been able to, uh, to to produce something a bit more inspiring. And, and, but I, I think um, Marvel US's um, kind of um, main uh, ethos behind all that was, was really just at the time anyway, because it was when the, a lot of independent publishers like Dark Horse were starting up. They just wanted to glut the shelves of um, comic book stores um, with, uh, with with Marvel product, and um, and now that was um, that was what they did. And uh, some of it uh, of not particularly high standard. I mean, some of the, the Marvel UK titles, which you know, I won't name, were, were certainly nowhere near as good as as Death's Head. And um, I know in the end, perhaps that that counted against not only Marvel UK, but but the, the brand of um, of Marvel itself. So, you know, after a, a, a couple of years of this this kind of amazing explosion of new material, the uh, the axe um, fell, and uh, you know, almost all of it disappeared. Not overnight, but you know, quite quickly. I mean, what was good about it certainly was that um, a lot of new writers and new artists um, got their their first kind of really crack, real good crack at comics. I mean, that was where uh, um, Brian Hitch um, really started out and Liam Sharp and uh, you know, other people, uh, Andrew Curry, who've um, since gone on to great things. So, uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it, was, uh, it, it, was a, it was a good time to be in comics. Because, I mean, you mentioned Liam Sharp there and because, uh, uh, what was it, Death's Head 2, I think the, the, uh, the American edition of that sold to me ridiculous, like half a million copies uh, at one point. Yeah, it did. It was 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 there a sense of because um, because this this material was was uh, stuff that would, you know was coming out of um, the the new origination at, at Marvel UK was there a sense of <laughs> we've 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 taught the Yanks uh, how to play their own game here or you know <laughs> was, was, what, what was what was that relationship like. Well, I, I don't think any, anyone was ever quite that um, that that arrogant. So, so no, yeah. But I, I mean, I left by then because I left in um, 
Oh, it left Malcolm Kane, 19, oh, I can't remember what one it was, but it was, it was just before the, 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 the Paul Neary um, era. So uh, I would only kind of hear second hand, uh, mostly. About, and I wrote, um, you know, I still co-wrote uh, the, the second series of Nice and Ben Dragon with, uh, with Dan Abbott and Steve White, which was very different from the first series and um, completely different. And Paul Neary wants to turn into a, a much more kind of standard superhero strip with, um, in his words, um, Big, lots of big panels and people shouting up in the air. So it, it became something completely different to what it originally started out as. Um, but, uh, um, and, uh, and that again, in a way, it kind of fell foul of um, the, the original series of um, Pendragon and um, fell foul of Tom DeFalco, who came over and said some very nice things about it, but said, you know, it's not really Marvel. What we need is more superhero based stuff. And that was something that Paul Neary was completely on board with. And, uh, you know, that was, um, you know, the, the Marvel UK explosion of death and everything that followed it came uh, came from that really and uh, and that's also why uh, series two of Knights of Pendragon looks so completely different um I'm not sure I answered your que- question I got you know, wandered off down a weird cul-de-sac but um no no, no it's fine it, it's just it, as 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 a uh, I mean let's face it as a foreign adjunct of you know a, 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 what is now acknowledged to be a major cultural force in 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 the US um i'm i'm always interested about the the commercial relationship between you know people working at one end of that and 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 the other and i mean you've essentially answered that that they were they were they were very nice but were quite quick to Say well, just just remember what we do, you know. It- well, there, there was there were certain. Uh, I mean, uh, generally speaking, the uh, the editors at uh, the Marvel US and perhaps the freelancers as well. I don't know, but uh, occasionally words would would filter back and um, what what they thought of the the Marvel UK stuff, and um, and in many cases the answer was. Uh, not a great deal. I remember there was on the, my God, they got Nick Fury sitting down taking tea with the Punisher. That would never happen. God damn it. And, uh, you know, I mean, there were, there were occasional kind of blips like that, that really, uh, you know, that, that was where the certain things were lost in translation. It was probably because, uh, you know, those Marvel UK writers were, were not as familiar with, uh, you know, the Marvel US um, ethos as, uh, as they might have been. Um, but they also have said very nice things about um, about Death's Head and you know Death's Head, particularly the Simon Furman version of Death's Head, still crops up from time to time in uh, in, in Marvel comics. So uh, I know it was um, it was it was there was a lot of it wasn't all kind of um, you know negativity. They were actually quite impressed with a lot of stuff uh, Marvel UK did. But as I said, I'd, um, I'd, there's probably a lot more to say on that subject, but I'd uh, I'd left by then. Well, I, I'm, I'm interested in. in uh kind of exploring a little bit before uh, your time at Marvel UK. You know, you, you were a, a comics fan, a comics reader, somebody who wanted to work in comics. Um, just, I mean, where, where are you from originally? Do I detect a, a Midlands twang? Uh, um, <laughs> well, first of all, I've had that one. Uh, a lot of people seem to think I'm Aus- Australian, um, again, which I, uh, and I have no idea why. But I'm originally from, uh, from the northeast. I was born in uh, in uh, Corbridge, just outside uh, Newcastle on Tyne, and I you know, lived for a long time in uh, in Whitley Bay, which is on the northeast coast. But uh, you know, we got um, uh, my my, uh, my dad, who now lives in um, in California, and he was um, he, he was a scientist, and he was a very kind of ambitious one as well. And he, he would just go where the where the work was, wherever that happened to be. So we uh, we got dragged around the country on a fairly regular basis. We never lived anywhere for longer than four or five years. So I know I think what, whatever accent I have is just like an amalgam of all the different places we live. I mean, you might not be completely off um, off, off track with the the, the Midlands twang because I mean we we did live in in Northampton for about four years. Uh, were, 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 um, you know, if you can imagine Alan Moore's accent, I mean that that's basically the Northampton accent. So I don't I don't think I've picked any up, but but maybe I have. The kind of comics you were reading when you were younger, I presume those those, those were Marvel. Those were the kind of comics that you. Well, they, they they were eventually, but the the first comic I really remember getting into was uh, was smash which was uh, an ibc comic and um and it was it started out as a reprinting uh you know, marvel material kind of severely edited and chopped about but things like fantastic four spider-man the hulk and so on but i, I missed all that and uh, the very first issue i bought was i think was was the first one the first where it just relaunched with all um new material and um 
just some wonderful strips in there, which I, I still uh, love, like uh, Janus Stark, a super escape um, artist who was, uh, you know, had a kind of a Reed Richards-like physique and could uh, slither in and out of, um, of any confined space. It was a, a Victorian era it was set in. It was all drawn by uh, um, Francisco Solano Lopez, who was um, a Spanish artist, it may not surprise you to learn, but, uh, you know, he did a wonderful version of... Uh, Victorian London, uh, all kind of uh, you know, street lamps and smog and kind of uh, pinched um, faces. And, uh, you know, just, just loved that strip. And, um, but my favourite was probably Cursitor Doom, who was, um, was like a, a Doctor Strange character, possibly um, patterned after um, Alistair Crowley, the black magician. He certainly looked like um, Alistair Crowley, drawn by uh, Eric Branbury. And uh, almost every strip in the in smash i loved and uh, i only got into marvel uk when um, uh, the mighty world of marvel launched and um, that was on tv with uh, a, a, an ad voiceover by stan lee which i can i can still still remember it was uh, like animated uh, john buscema or john buscema get the pronunciation right artwork from um, uh, from the first cover and it was uh, stan saying uh, the mighty world of marvel find them before they find you and um, and it was obviously a good slogan because it's stuck with me ever since and um, the, you know i was uh, it, it cost 2 P more than the smash to buy. So, you know, I came very close to not being allowed to buy the Mighty All of Marvel with my pocket money, but, uh, you know, I, I did. I became a, a, a massive fan. <clears throat> Although, I, you know, I still um, love English comics as well. Was 2000, uh, obviously 2008 started in 1977. Uh, was, was it something you were a fan of? And when you were working at Marvel UK, what... What was the attitude there towards 2000 AD? Oh well, everyone loved it, yes. Uh, and uh, but I, uh, I, I mean, I, I started reading 2000 AD, and I still have my first issue, and probably even the Space Spinner as well somewhere. And but I, I kind of lost track. I, I drifted away after about uh, you know issue 80 or something. I, I don't really know why. Probably coincided with something else that was going on at the time, but. Um, and I didn't really get back into it until um, I went to Marvel UK. And I was sharing an office with um, Simon Furman and Richard Starkings, and, uh, who were both massive 2080 fans. They used to bring copies into the office and, uh, you know, and yak about it um, endlessly. And Ian Rimmer, of course, who was uh, our boss in the same office, who was, was ex of, of IPC. So, and, and also we had um, Robin Smith, who was still uh, the 2080 art editor at that time, was freelancing, mostly inking with some artwork as well for, for Marvel UK. So he'd come in and he'd stand uh, chatting with, um, with Ian and Simon about the latest um, Fleetway gossip. So, you know, I, I really got back in the 2080 again. And I, I remember um, some of the stories, the, the Alabama blimps and Dread storyline and, 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 and the fatties. And uh, I mean, I had missed some of the classic Brian Bond and uh, Mike McMahon stuff, but uh, I loved a lot of the, uh, the, the Casa Square. And that was when I think uh, John Wagner and Alan Grant were still writing together and, uh, you know, clearly making each other laugh because they're, they're some, of the, some of the funniest and darkest and weirdest um, 2000 AD stories. And, you know, you couldn't not love those stories. So um, I didn't start buying it again, shamefully, until I started working on it. But, uh, but I, uh, I used to read uh, Simon or Richard's copy. So, I, I, you know, I got, I got familiar with it again. Because it... it... <laughs> Especially doing a podcast like this, it, it's very easy to um, overfocus on 2000 AD, uh, particularly as you know it, it came to be Is such a thing possible. Oh, wow, focus on 2000 AD, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, and also uh, in hindsight, you know it, it is the sole survivor of, um, mm. of, of, of of that period. Was was there in any way a sense? Because uh, again, in hindsight, one when, when, when can see. Uh, the comics industry starting to run out of steam in the 1980s. But was there any sense of it at the time that things were becoming more difficult? There were more distractions for readers that readers were perhaps not being replaced when they, when they stopped reading? Well, um, not really. You know, it, it seemed like a very kind of vibrant and, uh, and actually prosperous um, time as well because there were new... Comics being launched all the time. 2000, he was still doing um, extremely well, and um, and may, may still have been selling um, 100,000 copies an issue at that point. And uh, um, I, th I mean, Fleetway slightly um, dropped the ball with um, 
with uh, you know they relaunched an um, eagle um, in the early 80s with a Dandair photo strip and it uh, didn't um, quite catch light in the way that they uh, that they hoped I mean it had some good stories in there as well it was a doom lord uh, drawn by Eric Branbury and uh, and um, and a full color um, uh, strip no, was it actually no it was a full color painted Dandair strip in the middle of the comic you know the photo strip was something else um, but I mean again I, it's, it's years since I read it but that kind of was was it, it didn't it wasn't a flop but it didn't do particularly well and uh but but because I suppose because I was at Marvel UK at that time, where um, they were going from strength to strength, that uh, you know Transformers was, was like uh, you know selling like hotcakes, and then we, for, after that we had um, Zoids and Thundercats, and uh, it was all. Um, uh, I mean, other titles, especially the reprint titles, was fall by the wayside. But um, no, it was. Uh, I, I remember it quite wrongly, perhaps I don't know, as being quite a, a prosperous time rather than a, a, and a you know a creatively active time rather than things being to fall apart. What made you decide to start writing comics? Was was it your experience of rewriting on editorial, or, or um, was it a change in your circumstances? Well, I mean, I suppose it. Uh, I, I didn't have any particular um, ambitions to write comics um, uh, when I saw, you know, because I was still thinking, well, I might uh, might become an artist um, someday. But when um, Captain Britain um, launched, it had a very restricted editorial budget, and um, there was, um, you know, there was quite a lot of reprint in it, and also a text um, feature, which um, cost next to nothing, but it was still more than Marvel, Marvel could afford, and. Uh, so Ian Rimmer wrote, um, wrote a few text stories and uh, he, he asked, uh, asked me to write one. So I kind of um, a, a adapted a story I would had in, had in mind uh, that I'd, I'd written, kind of half written years ago. And, um, and I, I sort of I, I rewrote it um, with, with Captain Britain in mind. And, uh, you know, there's enough money in the budget to commission illustrations. So that was probably my first thing. And uh, I think it was the, the thrill of seeing the, the the artwork, the spot illustrations that came in from that story. That was what made me think, hey, you know, this I I like this. You know, I could I maybe write a strip as well. And the first strip I wrote was um, Zoids, which um, um, again to save money was mostly written in house. It was um, in Rimmer most wrote wrote most of the strips. Simon Furman wrote a few and. Uh, they may or may not be, have been paid for, them, but 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 I wasn't for mine. I just just did it purely for the experience, and that that was drawn by Kev Hopgood, who did a you know a great job on it, and uh, and you know, Zoys was doing sufficiently well that uh, eventually we you know we were able to afford to, to get in the likes of Grant Morrison and uh, an external writers to work on it, and Ron Smith drew a few episodes. I mean, we didn't expect the artists to work for free, but uh, you know there was a bit of cross pollination with the two thousand AD. Um, gang <clears throat> and that was um that was what got me into in, into writing comics and when i when i left when i went um freelance a few years later uh, you know I, again i started off doing editorial stuff for, for uh, um uh, 2000 ad who then moved to um uh, Southwark Street, and there's this um, uh, building long since demolished and deservedly so called uh, Irwin house or a uh, Vermin House, as it was then known for the, the you know hot and cold running rodents, um, but but where I was where I was working the, the freelance studio unit I was in, which was uh, around the corner, was Steve Cook was there as well, who stars off at Marvel UK as well, and was now the designer on 2000 AD. He'd kind of put in a good word for me at uh, at, at Fleetway. I, I already knew. Al McKenzie vaguely because he'd, he'd been the editor of uh, Starburst and Doctor Who when I was at uh, Marvel UK, and um, so you know I, I just did editorial cover for um, Alan or Richard or whoever wasn't around at the time, and um, and uh, and I also um, got to write um, a few Future Shocks. So you know I, I kind of the, the writing sort of continued. Um, I don't think it was ever a, like a grand master plan. I just knew once I, I knew I wanted to do more of it. And the, the first one I, um, I, I I wrote was was one that Simon Jacob drew, which which um, led on to uh, to Armand Gideon. Because the, the 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 usual well, supposedly the usual way into two thousand eight is, is is to do a bunch of of future shocks. It, was there was there a sense in any way of of okay, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, it's that cross pollination that I'm kind of stabbing vaguely at. You know, it, it, was, was there any uh, reticence to 
go to 2000 AD, having worked at, you know, been known to have worked at, at Marvel UK, was, was there any sense of... Well, for, for me or for uh, the, the um, for, for Fleetway? Well, for both, <laughs> I, I guess. Well, I mean, uh, Alan uh, McKenzie and Richard Burton had both started out at Marvel UK in, in various um, incarnations. I mean, uh, Richard Burton worked on the, um, the the relaunched Hulk comic with uh, with with Des Skin, Paul Neary, and David Lloyd, and all those um, people. So he was a you know kind of a, 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 a an alumnus of Marvel UK, as was was Alan, and, and of course Steve. So you know there was uh, there was no real resistance i suppose if the if there could have been any it might have come from uh, steve mcmanus who by that point had, had moved on and was editing crisis and um, and starting to get revolver off the ground but uh, um no there was uh, no resistance at all that i remembered and uh, you know i was um, i was really um, kind of dead pleased to, to start getting work on on 2018 it was, uh, it was something that i'd always admired from from afar and uh, you know it was because uh, it, 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 it kind of confirmed my uh, decision to go freelance because I you know I really did it about it for a long time I've been in Marvel UK for, for five years and uh, which is long enough for any first job and there were so many reasons to, to, to leave and uh, but I you know if, I mean I hate leaving anyway if it was up to me I'd probably still be at school so I I, I did this for ages and and uh, I just remember going for a drink one night with uh, with Steve Cook and uh, and Steve Dillon who I didn't know at all at that point and I was just saying you know you know, I, I, I feel like it's time to move on. Should, should, should I quit? What if I don't get any other work? And he, he just said, well, just quit. Then you'll have to find work. And um, and it made sense. And I went back to Marley Cain and I had an absolutely dreadful week, which just confirmed all my uh, my reasons for uh, for wanting to, 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 to leave. So, you know, I, uh, I, I, I kind of quit and it was absolutely the right thing to do. And um, there's something Steve Cook said as well, which is uh, just um, – Go with the flow in in life. You know, you only get presented with a certain a, a number of opportunities, and don't be king canute. You know, even if it doesn't seem quite like your thing at first, then just uh, you know, just, just you know, you might learn something. Just 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 go with it. And uh, you know, to, to be honest, um, two thousand eighty was about the best job you could possibly have walked into from Marvel UK. So uh, you know, there was there was no reason not to go really. Because this is the, the the phase of of British comics. Um, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of of um, stuff that, that Pat Mills has said and, and various other people. That by the the 1980s, um, people who were fans were the ones who were coming in to to edit and and uh, create these comics. You know, it, it, up until the 1970s, by and large, the the uh, the editors, the people at the publishing houses, were were not. You know, it was a job, and it was yeah. a you know a fairly respectable uh, job working in publishing, but they weren't necessarily fans. I don't know if you've read Steve McManus's uh, book, uh, A Mighty One, which is the history of his um, time as Star. When he came into comics in the uh, in the seventies, and it was a completely different landscape, and it was it was much as you described. It was this kind of people in uh, in tweed jackets, uh, smoking pipes, kind of probably not standing around, leading on leaning on fireplaces, but you know that kind of thing. And they'd all been in the they were all ex military, or uh, you know they come a very different. Or newspaper publishing, perhaps, from very different backgrounds, and uh, you know, absolute professionals who knew the you know the the the, the world of comics, you know, the practical side of comics in, inside out. But uh, no, not fans. They're not not people who come into comics and um, as fans. Mm. And so it uh, yeah, it, it was it was quite different back then. And uh, you know, it's when I started, almost everyone in the office was a fan. Um, for for good or ill, I mean, I suppose it has uh, a good and bad that has good and bad aspects to it. But yeah, I, I was because I was thinking of Nick Landau. Um, who, you were okay, yeah, and and um, it, Richard Burton as well. I, I think I think uh, Richard um, Burton had done like fanzines and stuff in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, that's right. He he, he was um, uh, he was somebody who was at the 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 kind of watershed nineteen seventies UK comic mart. Um, yeah, events you know that, that, that people like Bolland talk about. Um, and I, 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 I wanted to, to, to get a sense of um, whether this had a major effect on the direction of comics, whether, you know, it, it's it's no longer just a, a job. It's no longer just part of publishing. It's people who actually have a passion for this, who, you know, care about it more than just what the paycheck is. And it, 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 you know, it seems you very much 
on the opposite side of that, you know, you 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 loved comics. You were a fan. Yeah, well, I think it. Uh, I think it definitely helps. I mean, I'd uh, you know, if I was in a position to recruit anyone, I'd, I think I'd be more likely to recruit a, a fan than uh, than a non fan. But I think the danger becomes when um, you know you start producing comics that are kind of aimed purely at comics fans, or, or even worse, do it to impress your own friends who are themselves comic fans, because it can become you know, incredibly kind of parochial and insular, and uh, you know, ju- just um, is it no good for entry level readers because uh, you know. They, you know, they, they kind of feel excluded. I mean, one of the good things about the um, the early um, days of comics in, in Steve McManus's his era was that everything was um, was was produced with, uh, with with new readers in mind, and every issue is somebody's first issue. And by the way, that that was something you always that was something you always tried to adhere to when I was at Marvel UK as well. Whether that came from Ian Rimmer with his IPC background, I don't know. But um, but yeah, you always had to remember every every issue is somebody's first issue. And, uh, and I don't think Marvel UK ever became too fan focus even though we we're all fans producing it but yeah that is a real danger and i've definitely seen that happen and perhaps more so even even now because um i mean comics i mean it's it's had a real new lease of life since all the all the marvel movies uh, which uh, you know has has reignited um, interest in the in the comics and the source material again and you get readers and you only have to go to, to conventions and cosplay events and you see people that you never saw at um at, at conventions when i was uh, was starting out and uh, um and it, it's i don't know it has a much wider appeal to uh, to, to 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 um to fans now but uh um, oh God! I blundered down another cul-de-sac. I can't remember. I started out. That is Who fair. am I again? <laughs> Who no, am I here? It's fine. We we we, 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 we basically covered it. I mean, yeah. Let's let's move on to talk about the, the the writing side of things because um, you've done a few future shocks and then um, Armageddon was your first proper series for 2000 AD. Um, Reading Full Power Overload, uh, it, it, <laughs> it it sounded like a fairly simple process how this came around. The, the editorial were just after stories of, of big robots hitting each other. Well, it, that that may have been the case. I I, I don't know, but uh, I don't think that was quite why Albert Gideon then started out. I mean, it was uh, when um, uh, my future cape shot came in. It was all about a you know guy who'd um, invented a, a, a sort of an addictive but deadly junk food, and he made a, a pact with the Grim Reaper. And there was something about the way um, Simon drew the Grim Reaper. It was all kind of uh, you know vertebrae and pointy edges and. Uh, you know that that really kind of uh, resonated with them. So that that was when they asked if I'd like to write a series for for Simon, and, and I was given completely free reign, um, really. But um, I kind of, um, I, I mean, I've said that, said this before, but I, I got a bit of stage fright, you know, because this is like, uh, you know, it's one thing to write a future short, but but a whole series. It was. Um, you know, I mean, to, to um, quote Douglas Adams, it was a bit like running down the street naked. You know, what, what if it's no good? And, um, you know, the, the most recent thing in 2008 at the time that really inspired me was uh, Zenith, you know, Grant Morrison, and C.V. Ole. And I'd always thought the back of my mind, well, if I ever write a series of 2000 you know, I want it to be as good as that. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's all about setting the bar too high, especially for a, for a novice. So I kind of got a bit stuck. So in the end, I just did a list of... Um, Everything I liked about strips in 2008, everything that, that appeal had appealed to me as a reader, and um, and giant robots kept cropping up, and um, so that was how I came up with the idea of the, the giant robot. And I also had a kind of a at one point I had a brainstorming session with um, um, Alan and uh, and Richard. And Alan came up with this idea of a of a Hollywood press photographer with like you know press passed in his in his hat and uh, and I liked that idea but I thought well could it be a bit more like Don McCullen the war photographer and um, you know and and you know then the, the, I had the idea of him being a psychic photographer as in someone who could kind of will images onto film because uh, you know not everything supernatural can be captured on film so it would give him more of a connection with the the the, the supernatural world of Armageddon and. Uh, it kind of evolved gradually, really. And I think when it really came together was when we saw Simon's uh, design for the Armageddon robot, because it was uh, immediately distinctive, I mean, immediately likable. And uh, and he was both cartoony when he needed to be and quite scary when he needed to be as well. And, um, you know, he was, I mean, as eventually written, he wasn't as complicated as we uh, 
as, as we initially worked out, and he had kind of uh, speakers mounted over the front of his body. And the idea was that these would um, replay uh, exorcism uh, rituals. And that was that kind of, you know, I mean, it's, it's an ancient album now, but uh, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts by uh, Brian Eno. And uh, it has a, like, supposedly a live exorcism as one of the tracks. And I thought, well, okay, if Armour Gideon could play that, you know, he could uh, you know, vaporize him. Spirits by the, the power of sound alone, and he had like uh, you know, built-in stakes that he could fire and, uh, and skewer vampires and uh, kind of quarts of holy water stashed about his body. And uh, but <laughs> but in the final analysis, all he did was just point his hand at people, blast them, and say annihilate. So uh, you know all, all that kind of careful planning uh, went by the wayside. But yeah, it didn't seem to matter. I mean, the the, the whole um, sort of. Um, uh, aspect of the character what his ethos was that he destroyed demons or so it didn't really matter uh, um, how he did it and uh, I mean the, the whole notion of um, the kind of dimension that's uh, populated entirely with um, with you know creatures from the afterlife particularly demons who are forever trying to break through into our world I don't really know where that came from because it's not my vision of an afterlife or anyone else's I know but um, but I mean again it seemed perfectly suited to, to 2000 AD and uh, you know it was I mean it, in terms of giant robot strips it never did ABC Warriors kind of business but it was it was popular enough to come back for two or three more series so uh, you know you can't uh, uh, for a first strip you, you can't ask for more than that Did it give you uh, confidence to in your writing to try other things or, or, or did you have a sense of, oops, I've done it once. How do I replicate this? Well, the, uh, the very next um, th thing I wrote was something I co-wrote with um, Dan Abbott and Steve White, which was uh, the Knights of Pendragon, which, which couldn't have been the, uh, more different from uh, from Armored Gideon, although there was a was a crossover, and uh, nobody knows about this. No one will care. But I've never I've never had a chance to to, to say it uh, out loud. There was uh, it, it, Simon Jay who invented this this kind of mu uh, museum of pagan antiquities, um, which is uh, you know, was full of uh, supernatural artifacts. And it, uh, it appeared in um, in Disenchantment, which was uh, the first strip that he had, the fan, first fan strip that he ever uh, drew, just for his own amusement. I incorporated that into Armored Gideon at some point and uh, I also managed to get into it into uh, the Knights of Pendragon I don't think I ever told Steve where it, yeah, or, or Dan where it came from originally but they liked it so so it went in and eventually even Paul Neary liked it and it, it became like the, uh, the the upstairs if you like of, of Mistech so you'd walk into the museum near the Museum of Pagan Antiquities, which is essentially like a you know boutique version of the Natural History Museum, uh, full of um, you know horrible artifacts. But you know there was this vast, great uh, underground complex underneath, which was Mistex Base. So you know it was uh, it was all down to Simon, really. Simon created the, the Museum of Pagan Antiquities, and I just just pinched it for everything I could think of. I, I do like the idea of a, a mass shared universe where accidentally. Uh, everything in because uh, of course uh, Armageddon has crossed over with uh, Savage and uh, and things like that. So clearly, this is all one connected universe with like Marvel UK at one end and 2080 at the other. Yeah, yeah well, that, I think that was the third series of um, of Armageddon, which was called um, the, the Collector, and it was um, you know we always said it was, it was oft repeated in the early series that uh, the Armageddon was kind of. Uh, just really, just an agent of a higher, a higher power called the uh, the Silent Ones, uh, they, they who walk the space between the moments. And and Simon said to me one day, so what what does that mean? You know, walk the space between the moments. What, what, what does that look like? How am I supposed to draw that? So in in the third series, I I had this. Um, the uh, kind of uh, woolly notion that they were kind of these beings that existed outside of linear, fourth dimensional beings exist outside of linear time, but they could intersect with it at any point. So. The, the collector, the, the character was uh, was a silent one who'd kind of gone rogue, and he was just reaching into um, you know pockets of history to to pluck out uh, characters he liked the look of to uh, populate his own universe. And it was uh, it was just an entire it was an excuse for me to write to uh, Bill Savage and Shaco and Ant Wars and you know, some of the other golden greats. And there was there was like an episode in in, in the middle of that where. Um, uh, 
uh, Frank White, the photographer, kind of gets literally transported back into uh, the, the history of 2018. It's a black and white episode drawn by Mike White, who uh, you know drew classic um, future shocks, and and I had the called the, the kind of the, the classic uh, bar at the bottom, thrill, power, imminent, dot dot dot, and uh, you know as 2018 used to have in the very uh, very early days, and it was just one episode after which in the next um, they immediately reverted back to Simon's style, and um, you know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what anybody made of it, <laughs> but it was it was just kind of my nod to the the, the history of 2018 and when I first started reading it, and uh, you know when I first loved it. Um, um, so, so yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, um, that that was that. What was your working relationship like with Simon? Because we had him on the podcast. Uh, I know, and I, I I watched it, and it was because uh, I you know I haven't seen him since Army Gideon finished, and uh, I, I felt slightly abashed actually because I mean he says at one point, uh, yeah, John had to write the uh, the second series, and yeah, uh, boy, that took him a long time. And I was, I was trying to think, well, why did that take a long time? And it's probably because I was um, I was juggling like freelance work at. 2080 and trying to write Knights of Pendragon umpteen other things at the time. And I suppose uh, uh, Armour Gideon got pushed to the back a bit. But w- what I didn't know is that, um, you know, Simon had actually quit his job and gone freelance in the hope of a regular supply of oh from 2080s. And I, was, and I was kind of sitting on my, uh, you know, finger up my thumb and apparently not writing anything. So, you know, Simon, if you're watching this, I, uh, I apologise profusely and I'm very sorry. Because, I mean, being a comics artist, I mean, a writer as well, obviously, but a comics artist is even more of a monastic existence because you, it's basically just you in a room with a, a piece of board or a computer now kind of trying to create something out of thin air. And it, uh, it's not a terrible, terribly sociable world and uh, possibly even less so if you're waiting for your, uh, your writer to get off his ass. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, but you know we got on very well. I didn't, I didn't meet him until I think I think he delivered the first episode. He kind of came into the office, and um, that was when I met him. And uh, you know, as you know, having spoken to him, he's very, uh, very uh, sort of affable character, very easy to talk to, and uh, we got on very well. And for for the second series, I I used a lot of Simon's characters anyway for this. Um, the, the the first the first bit of his artwork I'd ever seen was this thing called Disenchantment, which he just sent into Marvel UK when it, I was there, and it got um, published as part of their uh, Mighty World of Marvel showcase um, feature. And it was full of all these Terry Pratchett like characters he created himself, and uh, you know wizards and warriors and kind of little demonic creatures running around. So, so in the interest of giving Simon something fun to draw, I, I just um, incorporated all, all those characters into the, the second series of Armageddon, which turned out to be the right thing to do. Actually, yeah, can I just put in a word for uh, the later series of Armageddon? Because first of all, they're all in colour. And uh, Simon's a really good colorist. And he was one of the few artists who, who seemed able to deal with the, uh, you know, the, 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 the dreadful um, um, Fleetway mud that, uh, that, that passed for printing in those days. You know, his, his colors always um, stood out. And, um, you know, he, he, he did a great job on those, those later series. And I think we were both just finding our feet on series one, the black and white one. I mean, it's great that it's been reprinted. God knows I'm not complaining about that. But... Uh, you know, if it's uh, you know is sufficiently popular, let's have some of the later ones as well because they're uh, I think they're better stories and uh, you know they look great. Okay, yeah, uh, sales pitch over. No. <laughs> uh, a few lengthy silence. No, 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 no. So I, I just I, a, a colleague sent me a message, so I. Oh, okay. I had to quickly refer to that, but I need to press my space bar. Um, it. Let's, let's move on to talking about editorial because I'm, I'm I'm conscious uh, that we've we've um, we've talked quite a long time now, uh, and I've got a lot of questions still to go. Um, having uh, worked in editorial, having gone freelance, why did you then go back to editorial? Um, well, I was um, I was still um, freelance, and uh, in, in fact, even when I was editing 2018, I was I was free. I may have been the only freelance editor in 2018 um, history. And um, you know, the, um, the, the the idea was, and it uh, doesn't stand up to scrutiny, and didn't even then, didn't even then, was that um, you know that that would. Um, afford me a measure of um, um, freedom. And if I ever decided if I wanted to do something else, uh, I wanted to leave, I could do so at a moment's notice, wouldn't have to, to work a, a month's notice. And, uh, and and also being freelance, I wasn't entirely beholden to Fleetway. I could go off and write other things as well, or Egmont as it then was. But um, 
you know, as it turns out, editing 2080 is such a, an all-encompassing task that I didn't have time to write anything else as well. So, uh, or, or do anything else. I might as well have been on staff. Uh, but um, uh, Alan and Rick, well, there was, it, it was born out of two things, really. One was, um, Richard Burton was uh, was just about to leave um, uh, 2080 to go and set up um, Sonic the Comic. And um, so Alan McKenzie became uh, Farg, and I took over his old role. And it was also... Uh, right at the launch of um, of the of the, um, the summer offensive, which about which I know you have questions as well, and uh, you know Alan couldn't do it all on his own. Richard wasn't available, so you know they got me in on a on what was effectively a full time basis. I was in there um, five days a week, and uh, and and that was kind of it for the for for the next few years. So there was uh, you know that that was how I got back into editorial. I'd always hope to do a bit uh, a bit of uh, writing as well but uh, you know there just wasn't the, the time or the the hours in the day to do it so that that was how that came about i mean i was there was a there was another series of armageddon commissioned which i wrote while i was on 2000 i mean it was commissioned by by um, steve McManus. so i you know i wasn't uh, you know giving myself work but um and i think i wrote two episodes of vector 13 as well which came along later but uh, but you know, I, I didn't have um, I didn't have the time to, to write anything, and also I was been a bit iffy about um, editorial staff commissioning themselves to uh, to write scripts because it's you know it's a it's a position of power that you're in. It's incumbent on you not to um, abuse it, and there were never any definite rules about it. Um, and uh, you know, most 2008 editorial staff had written for the comic. I mean, Pat Mills did for obvious reasons. It was his brainchild um uh, alan grant did andy diggle did did later so it was there was, there's never any rule that um that, that said you couldn't do it but um no i i didn't really have time to do um much m- much writing anyway so it was all about the editorial for me was there was there kind of a financial pressure to for for because there was quite a, a, a bit a, a, during that period in the nineties there was quite a bit that was um written by people in editorial um yourself alan um was was there a financial pressure because of the tightening budgets because of you know uh, as, as anyone who's listened to this podcast uh for for any period of time will know you know 2000 ad and, and, and the magazine are voracious eaters of content so was 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 there a you know a pragmatic reason for for that as well, well the, the big budget cuts didn't uh, didn't come along um un, until um until later and it was uh, that that was that really began to bite with the regime change of management after John Davidge left, who was a great supporter of 2008. He used to read it and, you know, liked Armand Gideon as well, which, which didn't hurt. Um, but uh, when, when he left, um, uh, the other thing we, we had that was, um, was, was a problem at the time was uh, a, a change of um, uh, distributors. And uh, since from the beginning and up until that point, uh, 2008, it was distributed by, I think it was Express Newspapers. I, I can't remember exactly, but it was, a, you know, it was a big newspaper distributors and, uh, you know, they got it out with the papers and the magazines and everything else. And uh, But um, one day John Damage came to us and said, I've got this, uh, this great new deal with a you know, brand new distribution house. It's going to, you know, it's going to revolutionise um, the sales of 2008. And, uh, and then he told us the name of the. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm not going to quote them because, as far as I'm aware, and I've been looking into it the last couple of days. I think they went bust a few years ago, but I'm not entirely sure, and I wouldn't wish to be causing a dying lash of their tail. But um, Alan and I knew them of old from uh, Marvel UK, and uh, which was plagued and beset by distribution problems. We could we could never get into the, the comics into, you know, the um, the, the news agents as, as many as we wanted, and uh, so our reaction was. Uh, Dear God, no! Are you insane? Why didn't you ask us? We could have warned you. you know, don't do it. But by that time, the uh, the ink was dry on the contract, and uh, we just knew what was going to happen. And and what happened was that two thousand within about less than two months, two thousand eighty went from selling uh, you know eighty thousand copies in issue to in in the early sixties, and. Uh, which was, you know, just a catastrophic um, decline. And um, you always expect to lose um, readers. I mean, uh, you know, people grow up, people use in, lose interest or get into other things or, you know, their favourite strip finishes or one starts up they don't like. So, I mean, readers kind of trickle away <coughs> all the time and uh, hopefully you, uh, you put on new readers as well. But uh, 
But, you know, we were just hemorrhaging, bleeding out um, readers. And, uh, you know, that was, I'm convinced to this day, as in Alan, that that's entirely down to the change of uh, distributors. And, uh, and you know, that, uh, you know, I imagine we're never going to say, well, OK, we, we screwed up. Let's go back to Express newspapers or whoever it was. But what they did do, which was, uh, you know, uncharacteristically bountiful, was to... Uh, commission a tv ad campaign um which is um I mean, it's still on youtube actually in fact i um i made a note of for anyone who's interested to follow it up it's it's on youtube and if you um if you type in tv ad full length 2080 advert from 1994 it will appear and uh I mean, it's very, very, the animation is very of its time, but um, it was, um, it, it was kind of, it was quite, it had a big budget and it had these little animated sequences. And so you had um, a Rogue Trooper animated in the style of Henry Flint and you had Slain in the style of Glenn Fabry and, uh, and it, it looked great. And uh, the only problem was that, um, you know, the uh, generous budget that had been allocated to the ad uh, was, uh, didn't leave anything over for, for, and placing it in in the schedules for actually buying ad space, and I saw it once. It was I staggered in front of the pub on Friday night. It was it was on late night on Channel Four. I thought, wow, this is surely the first of many times I'm going to be seeing this ad. But uh, that was it, and it, it cropped up on the you know the the QVC if it even existed at the time, the, the Limbo Channel, the kind of but between um, you know the ancient black and white documentaries about tractor maintenance or you know like. You know, all like TV was was it was a thing at that point, and um, but uh, there was there was very little on that anyone was interested to watch, and uh, and I think because that was a cheap advertising spot, that was where the ad ended up. So, you know, as gorgeous an ad as it was, and and still is in many ways, uh, nobody saw it, or at least not enough to make a big difference. Um, so what happened was that sales um, blipped upwards and um, for a very short period of time, but then almost immediately settled down to exactly what they'd been before. Um, so we, we were all wringing our hands a bit. And uh, But, you know, what saved 2080 and the magazine only a year later was, uh, was the Judge Dredd movie, which just reinvigorated everyone's interest in it. And we put on tons of new readers. So, I mean, it goes back to something I was trying to say in the, the magazine interview, which is that um, 2080 in the Judge Dread universe has kind of um, lived a, a bit of a charmed existence. I mean, we, we escaped from the, the crash of Maxwell Consumer Publishing by, by a whisker. And uh, we escaped from, uh, you know, this, distri- this appalling distribution house and, um, you know, the, uh, the mistimed advert. And, um, you know, and, and it's still going. So, uh, you know, <laughs> for some reason, 2000 AD is, is meant to happen, you know, and I hope it, uh, it, it has a, a long future. I mean, look, 2000, it's 2021, for God's sake. I mean, the, 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 the big question in the, uh, the, 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 the input page, the, the, the mailbag when I was there was what's 2000 AD going to be called in the year 2000? And uh, we did briefly flirt with the idea of calling it um, 3000 AD or you know, going one year of 2001 AD, then 2002 AD. But, uh, you know, it didn't take much um, thought to realise, well, this this is a brand now. It doesn't really matter what it's called. And, uh, and the fact it's no longer the future doesn't really matter. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's, um, so it, it, it became and, uh, and, uh, and has remained uh, since... And, and again, I've drifted miles away from your original question. <laughs> no, it's right. We'll, we'll talk, we'll talk I'm about the to human speech. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the um, the uh, Josh Dredd movie in a, in a moment. Um, yeah. I, I wonder what your working relationship was like with um, Alan McKenzie, who, who um, you know, this is a period when there was a lot of change in editorial um, uh, for 2000 AD. And I, I, I wanted to get a sense whether um because you know we, we all like to think of tharg as being like a singular individual who sits at the top and and you know uh, controls everything but you know we've had uh, burton we've got alan we've got yourself um uh, david bishop uh, will uh, be coming along in the narrative shortly um and i, I wonder what that that the, the the working relationship was like whether there was a division of of tasks or whether alan was still you know tharg at that point. Well, Alan was still Tharg, yes. And uh, although, I mean, at that point, I was, um, I was answering all the letters. I was, I was Tharg on the input page, but Alan was, uh, was the editor who would, uh, you know, commission them um, new strips and, uh, and uh, talk to the freelancers. Although, I mean, that, that's, um, I mean, to, to talk about, uh, 
my working relationship with Alan. I mean, it was it, it was great. I mean, I, I hope you uh, managed to talk him into doing one of these um, the, these interviews sometime. I mean, and he, he's not very keen on the idea. He doesn't like to dwell in the past. But he is one of the funniest and the most entertaining people you could uh, you could wish to meet. And he was uh, you know great fun to work with, and he was very sociable as well. You know, I mean, I you know I don't particularly like the phone. It was it was a means to an end and a necessary evil when I was editing the comic and. Uh, Nowadays, you can more or less do it all by email, but uh, but Alan made a point of um, of ringing the, the freelancers and having a you know personal relationship with them. And he would spend endless hours on the phone to John Ridgway or Mark Miller or whoever, and uh, you know he was he was a very good public face of um, of, of the comic, um, as well as uh, you know being uh, being a Tharg. Um, so yeah, and no, I I, um, I really enjoyed working with him. He was an old friend of Steve Cook as well, who was uh, the designer that by that point. So it was uh, it's actually a very harmonious time to be working on the comic. Because uh, speaking about harmony, um, the summer offensive, which was uh, for those who are uh, ignorant of, of this period of two thousand eighty history, was where, um, and I'm using air quotes here, uh, two thousand eighty was handed over to um, uh, newer writers. So, you know, by this point, John Wagner had, had um, decided to, to um, effectively walk away from, from uh, writing Dread uh, for 2008 on a regular basis. He had been still writing Dread for the magazine. Yeah, that, yeah. He wanted to concentrate on that and, and also editing the strips of the magazine. So that was, that was what that, that um, came mm. out of. But, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you hadn't finished answering your question. I'll, no, I'll it, you. It, it, um, uh, you know, you've got Grant Morrison... You've got uh, Mark Miller and John Smith, um, who all contribute to this big relaunch with lots of ideas. And, and within that, uh, you know, you've got Big Dave uh, <laughs> and various other strips as well. Um, I just want to get your recollections of of this and and uh, what the intentions were, what the outcomes were, whether you think it worked. Looking back on it now. Yeah, well, I, I was brought in to, uh, to to help with the launch of uh, Summer Offensive. It was literally just about to kind of go live when I was uh, um, brought in, and uh, and I, I can't remember now if it was um, it was like a package that um, Grant Morrison, Mark Miller, and John Smith presented to 2008, which is uh, hey, you know, how about if we wrote the comic, the whole comic for a few months, or whether that um, came from um, Alan or Richard, but you know that was the uh, that that was the idea, and. Um, uh, you know, and Grant Morrison, Mark Miller, John Smith. Um, now, as then, were were three of the the best writers in in comics. Still, relatively new to comics at the time, particularly John Smith. Uh, so, um, but but you know, very exciting um, young talents. And uh, the idea was to take 2000 AD back to its uh, its punky roots, where it was. Um, well, for want of a better term, uh, offensive, you know, would actually put people's noses out of joint, make people sit up and take notice. And, uh, you know, that was a that was a noble aim. But um, the, the, the problem with that possibly is that, um, I mean, for something that's been around for, for 40 years, I mean, not, not then, but it'd been around for a long time. It's a bit like uh, the nearest thing I can compare it to is, is Doctor Who, which has been around forever and uh, has a you know, a vast and varied um, um, set of fans, all of whom have a very different idea about when its golden era was and uh, and what made it great. And um, so, and it's you know, with that huge um, age range, it's, uh, it, it's it's almost impossible to please um, everybody. I mean, if you ask somebody, um, you know, when was two thousand eight at its best? It's usually either when they first started reading it or when they were most into it. But you know, it's obviously not going to be the same for everyone. And, um, and I think what the Summer Offensive did um, uh, was, uh, you know, it, it may well have attracted new readers, but it, it did um, uh, offend some of the more conservative um, readers. And uh, who, uh, and, and I mean, it was it was one of those shakeups that still happens in comics. Um, and uh, you know, you get in, the, in Marvel, for example, all the time, where um, you know, kind of uh, Captain America is really a Hydra agent. Um, you know, Thor's a woman. Uh, I mean, on the nits and infinity call you know i mean it, it, it starts out as as this kind of uh, oh god what what are they doing how can this be and it, it excites kind of a new interest in the stories and the characters but eventually after a while you know it gradually set and settles back into a more familiar pattern which is is what happened with the summer offensive but at the time i suppose for all the uh, 
you know, the diehard regular readers knew, um, you know, John Wagrell, Grant, Pat Mills had all been supplanted by uh, Grant Morrison, Mark Miller, John Smith. And you know, how dare they? You know, who do they think they are? You know, uh, I hate these stories. Well, you know, the, the, the story, I mean, I think they did a fantastic um a dread mega epic, which was drawn uh, mostly by Carl Suscara and is, you know, still some of his finest work, I think. And uh, I really liked that uh, story. But the thing that divided um, everybody, I suppose, was, uh, was, was Big Dave. And um, I mean, can I first say, uh, first of all, I, I, I'm a big fan of, um, of Big Dave and uh, it is properly funny. You know, I mean, the, the, the scripts are you know, were laugh out loud funny. And um, you could just see the fun. It, it was like, the thing I was compared to is when John Wagner and Alan Grant were writing Dread and clearly making each other laugh. And it was just, uh, you know, it's it just, you know, great fun. And uh, and, so, and so was Big Dave. And, um, but the thing that um, put the seal of approval on it for, for me was when um, uh, Carl Barks um, came into the office, who was, uh, he was a contemporary of Walt Disney, and he'd uh, created the character of Scrooge McDuck and various others. And he was he was ninety five when he came, and still bombing around the world. And uh, I, I can't remember why he was there. He might have been it was something to do with um, uh, Fleetway editions, whereas uh, you know had been the uh, formerly London editions, which had been uh, subsumed into the Egmont biomass by then. And uh, they were in the same office as us. But um, uh, Karl Barks came in for whatever reason. And, uh, and there was an episode of Big Dave in the office uh, drawn by Steve Parkhouse. And he was already lettered because, you know, Steve uh, letters all his own work. And Carl Barks was just, just sitting there in the corner with this episode kind of doubled up and literally crying with laughter at, uh, at Big Dave. And, you know, for, for me, that's, uh, that's as good as Walt Disney telling you you're funny. You know, it's, it's, it's as good as ours. But anyway, but I can, by the same token, I can see why the readers didn't go for it. I mean, it was... Uh, First of all, it wasn't uh, ostensibly a, um, a humor, uh, sorry, a science fiction strip. I mean, the, uh, the, the kind of the, the concept didn't really fit, didn't really belong in 2080. And, and also it was, um, you know, a no holds bar, barred humor strip, you know, which set out um, purely to make you laugh. I mean, with dread, the, uh, the, the humor is the black humor is integral and it always counterparts, the, you know, the darker aspects of the stories. But with Dave, it was, Big Dave, it was all about... Um, trying to make you laugh. And uh, historically, the, um, the, the readership of 2000 AD are intolerably stingy about being asked to laugh at anything uh, other than the, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the kind of attendant black humour in other strips. So, uh, yeah, they didn't like it. And I remember getting into, into the office one day and somebody had, uh, had nailed a page of, of Big Dave to the front door of Egmont House where... Um, um, 2080 was that then was where the editorial office was, and it scrawled across it in red and marker. They'd written, "Why, Thug? Why?" And um, and I, I took, took it upstairs to to, to Alan, and then uh, just uh, shoved it across his, his desk. And uh, I don't think I like Big Dave, Alan. He said, well, "It's just one reader, you know. You, you never, no one's going to love everything." But um, within days, uh, you know, an issue, um, and it was the one with the Big Dave. Um, cover which features a uh, Saddam Hussein riding an ostrich um uh, someone had torn that in half and uh, sent it back to the office and scrawled across the front cover they written 2000 AD RIP and um you know it was it was despite being uh, qualitatively uh, you know a wonderful and a genuinely funny strip it just wasn't pro probably possibly right for 2018. And I, I think um, Big Dave uh, bore a lot of the brunt for why people didn't like the summer offensive. Because if you look at what else was in it, so I mean, Maniac 5, you know, an archetypal giant robot story written by Mark Miller, drawn by Steve Yowell, you know, by any standards, one of uh, 2018's best um, artists. And uh, Slaughter Bowl, written by John Smith, which is basically rollerball with people riding giant dinosaurs. I mean, you know, why has that never been a movie? And, um, you know, it had such a lot going for it. But, um, you know, it, it kind of, um, I, I suppose it foundered on the floundered on the horns of a Big Dave, to, to use an appallingly uh, mixed and mangled metaphor. Because do, do you think, do you think it achieved its aims? Because, you know, at, at this point, um, after uh, you know the the the, the fall in in uh, sales that uh, 
Yeah. Well, actually, you know, just stop you there. The fall in sales came after the summer offensive. It was after the summer offensive that um, that, uh, that that we switched to to this this other nameless distribution company. Oh. And, uh, I, I, there may have been a small decline in readership after the summer offensive because uh, not everybody went for it. Although, you know, a lot of people did. Um, but but you know the, the kind of rot didn't set in in terms of sales until we switched distributors, and I, I don't put that down to the summer offensive. I think that was that was more of a distribution problem. Well, it, uh, I, I wasn't going to refer to <laughs> to, to, to the comma thing, but I, oh. I was thinking more in terms of because you know the the the, the sales of two thousand AD had been r- relatively stable, but had you know uh, through the late eighties and and into nineties there, there was a, the, the the spike with um, slaying the horned god. Um, but you know, the, they weren't going up. I basically, <laughs> basically mean in, in the uh, uh, in the period. Um, and I just wondered whether the, the, the summer offensive achieved its aims of being a relaunch of you know. Um, well, I, I, I don't think it. I don't think it did. No, probably. I mean, much as I uh, enjoyed it myself. I mean. Um, it did alienate some of the core readership, and um, you know, and it probably um, lost more readers than it than it put on. And it wasn't TV advertised, um, which uh, so a lot of people didn't weren't really aware that it was out there either. So um, you know, as a bold and noble experiment, um, it uh, it didn't achieve its aims. No, and not through any want of uh, you know creativity or imagination or good intentions, but no, it it didn't do what it was intended or or you know was hoped that it would do. Because I guess as, as in editorial, and, and this holds true now as it always has, did, did you feel that to a certain extent you're in a bit of a bind? Because you're, uh, but certainly by the 1990s, um, you're, you are dealing with a readership that has grown up with 2000 AD, which is, you know, is not necessarily being replaced by young readers mm-hmm. um, who are versed in, uh, you know, that readership is versed in the history of the, uh, of, of the comic, but still wants something new, but doesn't want it to be too new. Um, were, were you uh, and Alan kind of um, in, in a bit of a bind in, in, in the, you know, when you try to change, you're inevitably going to upset those who have an idea of what 2000 AD should be? Well, it was always, uh, I mean, it was never intended that, um, you know, the triumvirate of um, Grant Morrison, Mark Miller and uh, John Smith would continue writing it um, um, endlessly. I mean, it was always going to revert back to uh, to John Wagner on Dread, Pat Mills on Slain. Uh, and, uh, well, a road trooper never really had, a, you know, a, a kind of, after Jerry Finley Day, there was never a, a single one single writer who was associated with Rogue Troopers. So he, uh, as one of the big three, he possibly came adrift a bit. But uh, you know, it was always in, intended that 2000 AD should revert back to something um, approaching its um, its original form, but with, with, with you know perhaps more of the punky element that uh, that Morrison and Miller and, uh, and John Smith um, brought to it. Um, so it's. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose you were in a, in a, in a bit of a, of a bind because um, the, the readership was was beginning to decline anyway, which you know happens on any um, on any title, and uh, the, the, it didn't really start going up again until I say the, the the Judge Dredd movie. But it was it was a gradual and gentle decline, and no more than you you'd really expect for a, a comic that had been around as long as it had, and uh, you know a lot of its um, readership was. Growing up, getting older, getting into other things, and um, you know, not necessarily being replaced by uh, by new ones, by by y- younger readers. Um, but um, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, there, there was um, the, the the decline came out largely as a result of, came about largely as a result of that uh, that that change of distributors. I think, and uh, who knows if we'd re- remained with uh, you know the newspaper distributors if that would have happened, but. Uh, I mean, it's um, it, it's still going. I, I don't know what it sells now, but it's, it's clearly um, you know a, a sort of a, a respectable amount, and um, and I, I hope there'll always be um, you know a, a market for it and uh, an audience who, uh, who who love good science fiction stories across a you know wide um, um, a wide range of ideas and characters and um, you know sort of um, I can't think of a third thing. <laughs> But yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, with something like, uh, you know, having Garth Ennis, um, Grant Morrison, Mark Miller, John Smith, uh, you know, 2080 had been effectively been through a brain drain 
um, in in the eighties. Yes. And, and and I mean, you mentioned a moment ago, you know, you you didn't expect these these creators to to, to hang around forever. Um, I guess that that was was that anxiety producing the idea, the idea that you know it, 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 as soon as you're um, finding people to write stuff. It kind of, you know, if, if it's well, just, it, it alerts other publishers to who they are. It, it wasn't as anxiety um, producing as, as it later became, because um, when um, um, John Wagner decided to stop writing uh, Judge Red for the Weekly, I mean, we had, um, you know, we had a few regular writers. I mean, uh, you mentioned Garth Ennis. Well, he was sort of um, Wagner and Grant's anointed successor on the Judge Red, because, you know, they really loved his writing in, uh, in Crisis and uh, and Revolver, and they they got on very well with him personally. And uh, you know he wrote some uh, some pretty good dread stories. But um, then he was you know he became part of the brain drain. He went to America. He wasn't available anymore. And at that at that point, we had um, we had um, Mark Miller and uh, and uh, you know a few few other well very few other writers really. I mean, unlike um, now where there's uh, there's any number of writers who can write uh, you know either a a, a very John Wagner-like uh, dread strip. I mean, I really like the one there, the, the Penisant Man storyline that's uh, running at the moment by Ken Neiman, which, uh, you know, that reminds me very much of John Wagner with his serious face on and uh, with very a very Cliff Robinson-like art job. And, uh, you know, Matt Smith now has a very good stable of writers who can do dread. You know, he, he looks like dread, he talks like dread, he behaves like dread. But um, in, the, in those days, when Alan and I were working on it, you um, know, Mills, Wagner and Grant, until Miller and Morrison, were the only writers who had ever written Dread. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it can be very hard to, to capture, you know, the, um, the, the sound of a character, the way he behaves, how he will react in a given situation. And editors can help with that. But, um, you know, it, it, and Alan and I were trying out new people, but nobody quite got it, like, uh, uh, like um, Wagner and Grant. Uh, in Miller and Morrison... Um, did a great dread and Mark Miller wrote a lot of um, dreads for us, but, um, um, you know, we were all very, we were, we were quite relieved when we got um, John Wagner back again, because it was clearly what the, what the comic was missing. And that was, um, that came back as a result of um, Steve Man McManus's uh, ministrations. I don't know what inducements he offered, but um, in the interim period, um, uh, John Wagner had been away and done the, uh, the, the Robert McKee screenwriting course, which uh, you know, David, Bishop and I um, later did. And I, I don't know if that fed into his dread stories or not, but it was like he came back reinvigorated. And um, the, 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 his first story um, yeah, for, for 2018, a long time, was drawn by Mark Harrison, who's you know probably best associated with Durham Dread now. You know, kind of fantastic artist, certainly one of the best in 2080s history. So it was like Dread was firing on all cylinders again. But uh, you know, we had a long fallow period in between where Dread was a bit directionless, and there weren't that many people who could write a, a convincing or a satisfying Dread. And uh, you know, that was um, that was one time when I felt we were in real trouble. Can you still hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you've gone quiet for a second. No, no, sorry, I was just I was limbering up. Um, because uh, one of the challenges that that certainly you seem to have faced is um some shall we call them dubious uh choices uh, that led to scripts that had to be used. Yeah, and. Well, that, and that so, sorry, uh, finish your question. Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking the, the you know the Michael Fleischer. Rogue Trooper, um, things like Parasites, and I, I, I wanted to get your your take on it. I'm, you know, I'm not looking for you to, to slag anyone off, but it's kind of that that stuff existed. Why did it exist? Mm. And you know, to place you in the position where it's been paid for, you got to run it. Yeah, no, that's. Um, I mean, it was the the the, the stock um, figure and the uh, you know the, the the drawer of unused strip was strips was building up. Um, yes, yeah, so and by the time I took over as Tharg, you know, we really had to do something about it. But I mean, I'm not going to mention any uh, um, creators um, by name because I just think it's unfair. I mean, nobody sits down to think, uh, you know, today I will write a strip that will live in infamy forever. You know, you always hope that you're going to write something good. But, I mean, since you mentioned um, Michael Fleischer, I mean, he's, uh, you know, he was like, uh, you know, um, greatly respected in American comics. And he was, uh, he was also a good friend of, um, of Richard Burton. And I think it was during one of Richard's uh, trips to the States that he got chatting with uh, 
with Mike Fleischer and um, suggested that he um, submit some ideas for Rogue Trooper. And kind of within weeks, almost, this multi-part Rogue Trooper epic crashed onto the desk, and um, and it just wasn't quite right. You know, it, it was like a you know a short story spun out to twenty four episodes or something, and and some of the dialogue was a bit perfunctory, and it um, it sat around for ages until. Uh, well, eventually it was Al and Al McKenzie who sort of uh, took the script aside and began to rewrite and boil the, the series down to at about a third of its original original length and got um, Ron Smith, who was like a you know, veteran um, uh, 2000 AD artist, to, uh, to draw it. But, um, you know, I mean, as, um, as somebody once said, it's, it's easier to restrain a madman than resurrect the dead. And, you know, there was no way of injecting life into, um, into the Mike Fleischer era of, uh, of Rogue Trooper. And, uh, you know, it, it's uh, sure enough, it failed to set the, the world alight and it wasn't uh, particularly um, popular with the readers either. But um, that, that was while Alan was, uh, was, was still Tharg. But um, when I took over, there was like a, as stacks of this um, this stuff still to run, and um, I mean, I did um, the best I could with it. Was it was a Harlem Heroes um, series, also written by Mike Fleischer in his Rogue Trooper era, which um, Kev Hopkins had drawn, and you know, Kev, very good artist, uh, particularly good at storytelling. He, he penciled this, and I got um, and Bio Siku is very good um, and painted, very very good with painted art to, uh, to to ink and color it. So you know, it looked really good. And, um, and then I set about uh, rewriting uh, um, Mike Fleischer's scripts and trying to inject a bit more of 2000 AD humor into it. But it uh, you know it was it was never going to be great. And um, there were many other sort of um, strips from that era that uh, I was kind of forced to to use up. I mean, I didn't. Um, it wasn't entirely that. I mean, no. While I was uh, while I was Tharg, I, I managed to get um, Vector Thirteen off the ground, which was kind of riding on the popularity of the X Files, and became a very uh, a short term hit. And uh, we got a lot of um, good writers and artists to work on that. And um, I commissioned uh, towards the end of my time there, commissioned uh, Nikolai Dante from Robbie Morrison, who was a writer I'd always um, wanted to work with. I mean. Um, David had, had found him and uh, and he quickly became like a, a stable on the, on the magazine. But, uh, you know, I, I knew I wanted to work with him. So uh, I commissioned that. And um, the other thing I'm still really proud of is uh, is Sinister Dexter, which um, I commissioned a one-off story for a special. It was like the, the alternative special. And the, the idea was all about parallel universes or different worlds. And uh, the lead strip was written by Pat Mills. And it was essentially what would happen if uh, Rico rather than Joe had become the, the Judge Dredd of Mega City One. But, uh, um, you yeah, know, that was um, Sinister Dexter was written as a one-off for that. And uh, that was kind of the standout script from uh, from that special. And I, I immediately um, commissioned another one. But um, shortly after that, I was moved on to the magazine. And, uh, you know, David saw its potential as a series. And, um, you know, it, um, and, and it, was, it, was, it became what it later became. But, you know, for all the, uh, the stuff I did use, had to use up that I would never have commissioned myself, I'm, I'm glad I was at least able to get those off the ground. The 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 challenge at the time because you know uh, Alan took redundancy uh, in I think uh, ninety ninety six was it I think a bit before that maybe a couple of years before that okay um, that uh, uh, along with the uh, along with the, the kind of budget pressures at the time you know you, you, uh, John Davidge walked away eventually it it, it, <laughs> it must have been quite tough to be juggling the prog, which, as we know, is a voracious eater of material, the, the magazine as well, with all this going on in the background. Um, you know, it, it, what, what, what's your memory of, of I guess, your, your mental place uh, that, that you were in at the time? Well, yeah, I mean, as I, I said, as I said once, uh, you know, you get into the office at eight o'clock in the morning, in the morning, and the job screams in your face for eight hours. And uh, if you're lucky, then you get to go home. But uh, you know, I, I didn't kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, run up and down waving my hands in the air. I, I just had to get on with it. And uh, I mean, by the way, there was there was no point at which I was editing 2080 and the magazine. I didn't have to uh, to, to juggle them both. So I kind of I went home one Friday as uh, as Tharg and came back in on Monday morning as the editor of. Judge Red Magazine. So, uh, you know, I was, uh, but 2008, it was, was enough of a challenge in itself. And uh, I mean, I didn't have 
Al anymore, so I was on my own. And uh, but not entirely because Steve McManus, who was the managing editor, was uh, was always there to ask. Who was always on hand, and he said, "Look, if you ever need any help, just." Uh, let me know. And um, similarly, when I was commissioning anything new, like uh, you know, Sinister Dexter or uh, um, Nikolai Dante, uh, you know, I would run it by Steve just to make sure I wasn't completely out of my mind. You know, so he was he was very uh, very helpful like that. But um, you know, he, he kind of it was yeah, yeah it was uh, it was the Christmas um, schedules and uh, which you know you have to do double the amount of work um, just in order to give yourself um, two weeks off at Christmas, and it was still just just kind of me editing it. I remember Steve looking at me one day and he said, yeah, you're doing all right at this, you know. I thought I think you might have crumbled by now. But, um, you know, I managed to keep it going all right. But, um, I mean, it's a weekly, like you say, it's, it's a voracious um, gobbler up of, um, of stories and artwork. And uh, and your freelancers aren't droids, you know, they're, they're human. And, uh, you know, they have they, they get ill, they, they get depressed, they don't feel like working, they're not able to work. And, uh, and so you always have to be mindful that words, the work is not just going to come in week after week, always on schedule, exactly when you want it. And um, so that that was the panic uh, was was always having something on hand to uh, to fill the gap when, for whatever reason, a strip wasn't uh, wasn't ready for publication. But you know, we never um, we never missed a, a deadline. We never went late on sale, and we we put in a lot of um, a, a lot of future shocks and uh, kind of one offs. But uh, you know, it's. Uh, in the end, it all worked out. Could, I, I, I do want to bring up the fire kind uh, situation, uh, just because that 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 leads on from the whole kind of notion of you know it's it, it's it's a, a hell of a job. Um, cause, uh, the, the the Paul Marshall uh, John Smith series um, missed the entire episode. I know, I know, and uh, you know I, I have to fess up to being uh, you know re- responsible for that, and it was it was entirely down to the uh, the original artwork being kept in the same uh, plan chest as the artwork was being slated to, to to send back to the freelancers, and uh, you know it was a particularly busy time. So uh, uh, incredibly, the first I knew of it was when Paul Marshall rang me up and said, uh, you know you've missed out an episode. And my initial reaction was, no, I haven't. But <laughs> well, I didn't say that because clearly I had. And, uh, you know, because it, we couldn't not run it. You know, we, uh, we, 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 kind of, although the, it, by, you know, by luck, more by luck, certainly than, than judgment, that particular episode was a kind of a, a dream sequence. So, you know, the episode before it and the episode after it flowed quite seamlessly and you would never have known there was anything missing. But of course, uh, you know, we had to run it. I mean, quite apart from anything else, it was a, it was a superb episode. So we, you know, at the end of the series, we we fessed up to what had happened. We printed the missing episode, and uh, and uh, that was perhaps the the darkest incident in my entire career on 2018. But I will say, in my defence, that uh, Firekind then went on to win a science fiction award and was still very highly regarded as a series. So uh, you know, I uh, clearly didn't do it too much damage. Um, I, I, yes, talk- I mean, abominably embarrassing. Should should never happen. I'm sure will never happen again. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about the, the the dread movie in a second, but um, just on that point, when 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 you were thug, when when you were commissioning things, um, thinking about the the things like the summer offensive that had happened, like the changing nature of of uh, the comic, bringing in new talent. Was that was there an aim that you had when when you're commissioning stuff? What was the intention behind your commissioning decisions? Was it just oh this 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 looks good, let, let's get it in the prog, or, or were were you trying to create a, a change in direction, a, a change in feel? Well, I mean, uh, Dave Bishop has said, uh, as David Bishop's been quoted as saying that 2008 has to keep innovating and and, and moving forward, and uh, you know, and and that's certainly true, but. Um, I think um, again with something that's been around for so long, you you also have to bear in mind the uh, you know the the, the core readership has been with it for uh, you know for its its entire run, and um, uh, so. so my uh, grand master plan, if I had one, was was really just to, to have like three solid um, staple strips that would would run more or less regularly, and uh, so I could experiment with the other strips in between and and, and do something maybe a bit more innovative or a bit different. So, um, dread is obviously the star of the show. So that's a, <clears throat> that's a given. Uh, Slain is easily the most popular character, so you know he was uh, he, he had to go in there, and uh, and I suppose if you're looking for a third. Um, 
sort of um, stable that has to be a rogue trooper. So it was always my uh, my plan to run the three of those on a you know semi regular basis and uh, and and just um, alternate with other new strips in between. I mean, I I didn't get to commission to many new ones for uh, for reasons we've uh, we've already discussed. I mean, the Vector Thirteen was the only uh, real new one of mine that uh, I, I commissioned from from scratch. Um, but um, but yeah, had I remained, had I stayed as editor, that would have been uh, that would have been my plan. So, so let's talk about the Dread movie. Um, uh, but by all means, yeah. which, I thought we'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, you know, I, 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 just as has happened with uh, with us at, at around um, the 2012 movie, you know, you, you you look at ways to capitalize even if you you can't necessarily uh take them forward but but Egmont the reading the account till power overload it it it, <laughs> it really feels as if there's a sense of fantastic great money, you know put the money on red let's just go 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 and then there was a slow creeping dawning of realization that this wasn't the the sure bet that it that looked like is 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 that inaccurate no, it's it's, uh, it's entirely accurate, and um, I mean, I, I think we knew from the, the the beginning. Although, you know, obviously, we were never going to admit it in the editorial pages that there was no way that Sylvester Stallone, the star of a Rocky and Rambo um, movies, was ever going to be able to rein in his ego enough to keep uh, Dred's helmet on throughout the uh, the course of the film. So, uh, you know, it, it just really became a matter of how long he managed to keep it on for. And um, I mean, I think the first 20 minutes of that that film are, you know, for me anyway, are everything you'd want from a Judge Dredd movie. I mean, it has a has a real, a, a great score for a start with uh, you know, tracks from Nine Inch Nails on there. And, uh, and you've got that uh, um, enormous epic sweep of Mega City One as you kind of zoom in over the city. And I remember seeing that for the first time uh, at a preview and thinking, wow, you know, we really are, we're here, we're in Mega City One. And it um, opens up almost immediately with a block war, which they uh, they did extremely well. And then when Dread eventually appears, he's, he's kind of um, you know intimidating a perp and looming over in a very dread like way and, and upping his sentence for uh, for answering back. And uh, I thought, well, this this is great. What were we so worried about? But from the moment it gets into the cursed earth, probably although they you know they realise the cursed earth extremely well. Um, and uh, Dread takes the helmet off, takes the uniform off, and um, you know, and it, uh, and it, and it just kind of drifts away from the, the core concept. And um, I mean, some of that is to do with the character of Dread himself, who works better on a comics page than he does on a big screen. I mean, in a movie, you need a big character arc, and you need someone to, to start. Um, with a particular mindset, um, generally one that's uh, you know that, that will change by the end of the movie, and then at some point has a kind of blinding uh, revelation and is and is is a different person by the end, and uh, you know which is an appalling distillation of uh, you know the the the, the kind of the, the narrative arc of a film. But you can't really do that with Dread. Dread always has to be Dread. I mean, one of the joys of Dread in the strip is that he is Dread in in any situation, and the fun comes out of dropping him into a particular situation, knowing that he's never going to bend, he's never going to break, he's uh, he'll crack jokes, albeit completely unintentional jokes, and uh, you know, God forbid if anyone laughs at him. But um, you know, they they try to integrate this um, this this kind of character arc for dread into the film. And I mean, I haven't seen it for a long time, I must admit, but I but I do remember the, it ending with everybody standing around clapping and, uh, you know, Stallone grinning all over his face and saying something to Hershey like, uh, feels good to be human, doesn't it, Hershey? Or something like that. And it's, uh, you know, kind of people were collect- collectively rending their garments by that point because it, it, it just, um, you know, it started out as dread and, uh, and ended up as as nothing like. I mean, having said that, it, it made a lot of money at the box office. It, it got uh, ignited a lot of interest in 2080 in the Dread magazine. So, you know, I, I'll always be grateful to it for that. But um, I did go to, uh, well, a, a bunch of us um, got to go and see a scene of it being filmed at um, Shepperton Studios. And I was uh, I was in a car with Pat Mills and Steve McManus and Richard Burton. And it was how long the drive was from, uh, from London to Shepperton Studios. Uh, Pat Mills kind of um, uh, began to tell the story of how he created 2000 AD and how it all came about. And, uh, you know, the, the, the whole of the car journey was really um, Pat Mills kind of um, telling his autobiography, or at least, you know, the, the part that applies to 2000 AD. So and that was uh, 
yeah, that, that was a kind of an eye opener for me because I don't think I'd realised even up until that point just just um, how much his baby um, 2080 was. But um, when we got there, I mean, the the, the sets so had been had been partially built, but you know, they hadn't. It was it was bright sunlight. It was uh, you know a lot of it hadn't been painted, so it was all just there was all of plywood and a lot of flats. And it looked a bit like a deserted western town. It certainly didn't look very much like um, Mega City One, but. The great thing was um, they uh, they had the um, the ABC robot, which was you know clearly based on I think Hammerstein, Hammerstein from uh, ABC Warriors, and it was a fully articulated robot. You could you could wear a rig with your hands in them, gloves, and kind of wave your arms around, make fists, and uh, you know it was hooked up to the um, the, the Hammerstein uh, the ABC robot rig, which would then completely mirror your uh, your own movements. And I I didn't get to go on it much to my chagrin, but um, but but some people did. And then we uh, after all that we got to see we got to see a scene actually being filmed, and um, and it was it was a scene. It's in the cursed earth where Dred's been taken prisoner by uh, the Angel Gang, and he's. Um, and he's tied up and they're, you know, they're generally torturing him. And you would not have known at this point that Stallone was Dredd, no helmet, no uniform, and um, no recognizably Dredd-like speech patterns. But what really made it for us was the Angel Gang, because you, know, you had Mean Machine in there who looked fantastic. And uh, Par Angel was played by Scott Wilson, who's one of my favorite actors, you know, always has been. It was in the, the Ninth Configuration, which has uh, you know, been one of my favorite films. Very weird film. It's like... Um, you know, MASH uh, directed by David Lynch or something. I mean, it's, it's not an easy watch, but but I love it. So I immediately, I, rather than, um, you know, being um, blown away by seeing uh, Sly Stallone in the flesh, I was thinking, wow, it's Scott Wilson. This is going to be great. Because, you know, the Angel Gang really looked like the Angel Gang. But um, and I wouldn't say our sort of, um, our hopes were dashed exactly when the movie came out, but it wasn't the film it, it could and should have been. Anyway, to your other questions about the film, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 more the the the, the kind of effect that it's had on two thousand AD because you know you you get a, a a blip in sales when there's a bit of mass media a, a, around a, a comic book, but um, you know there was a, a lot of time and a lot of investment into the stable of titles at the time because you know you, you you've got classic Joe's Dread, classic two thousand AD, and Joe Stred, Lawman of the Future, which is quite a bit, considering this was a 15 certificate, launching a child friendly uh, version of, uh, of, of Judge Dredd, uh, you know, that's the movie version, is an interesting decision. Do you want to explain some of the, 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 the logic behind that? Well, I mean, I think that's um, probably something you might have to ask um, uh, David, uh, David Bishop, about until the later date, because it was, it was his baby and uh, his brainchild uh, well i don't know if it was if the uh, the idea of it being a comic for, for younger readers was uh, was kind of handed to him as a fait accompli or whether that was uh, that was his choice but um trying trying to, to to think about why that decision might have been made it's probably because you know we had 2000 AD and Judge Red magazine, which were, you know, two very recognizable and not dissimilar versions of Dread. So if you are going to launch um, yeah, a new Dread comics, it's got to have something different. And uh, and I think perhaps the idea was to, to try and attract younger readers as well in the hope of, uh, you know, growing a future readership for, for 2000 AD. And it was... Um, and the, the the scripts, the stories were were, were much simpler. They, they were based in the the dread uh, movie universe, uh, much more than the comics uh, universe. With a, a a dread whose uniform was patterned after the movie dread, and uh, and it was it was very different. Not entirely bad either, but um, uh, you know it was, it was again another noble experiment. But um, uh, it it didn't really um, catch fire in the way that um, uh, we we that they hoped it might. It it's it is one of the um, the difficulties about comics engaging with other media, particularly film. That uh, it, there's inevitably going to be some way, in, uh, some compromise, some you know, some uh, negative effect on on uh, uh, on, on the the, the, the uh, original source material. Um, so often uh, the Joe Stred movie is, is uh, presented as uh, not just a millstone, but n n the thing that nearly took down 2000 AD. But that's that's not 
the case is there was there was a lot more going on at the time in terms of what was happening with IPC and 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 uh, well with Egmont. Um, you know what what was what was happening behind the scenes at this time that that, that was creating pressures on you as editorial, um, even well, at the time well, when you got a, a big movie. Well, there was a there was a changeover of management at uh, at around that uh, that time, and that was. Um, and again, I can't remember the exact chronology, chronology, but that that was around the time that John Davidge was uh, was was leaving, and a new um, um, sort of um, uh, management regime was uh, w- was coming in. So that was because uh, they uh, they didn't really. I mean, as I say, John John was a fan of um, 2080, and uh, you know was was very friendly with uh, Richard and, uh, and and David, and uh, you know and all of us, and you know had a, a vested interest in the future of the title, but um, the the new. Um, People didn't really know quite what to do with it, and uh, it seemed their only kind of bold move was to slash the editorial budget um, every year. And uh, so it was a bit like the death of a thousand cuts. So you're, you're always um, battling against that um, aspect. Um, but uh, and that made it difficult. I think as well that you know, whereas um, John had been perfectly um, happy to continue to um, you know employ me as 2080s editor. Um, although I was freelance, the, the new regime were considerably less kindly disposed towards freelancers. And this, I mean, this is something I've found on and off at other companies over the years, that uh, that for some reason, the management can be suspicious of, of freelancers, almost as if they feel they're, they're getting away with something, you know, and uh, they, they just, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't get it that I was editing one of their flagship titles and uh, while still a freelancer. And at the same time, you had um, David, who'd been, who was on staff and been itching to get his hands on 2000 AD for a long time. So, um, you know, when I um, was eventually moved onto the, the, the magazine and David became uh, the, the new Thark, I wasn't uh, entirely surprised. So that was, uh, that was the difficulty for me. But, um, I mean, the difficulty of the company and the, you know, stable of 2000 AD and Dread titles, I mean, because that was at the time of the movie, which whatever its drawbacks uh, was, was no doubt a huge shot in the arm for the sales of 2000 AD. I mean, it's, um, it, it wasn't the worst time. It wasn't the worst that we'd, uh, we'd endured. I want to talk a, a, a little more uh, about your writing. Because I'm, I'm conscious that we spent a lot of time on on editorial and and uh, behind the scenes stuff. But could, uh, Mercy, by, by the way, can I just say thank, thanks very much for for giving me a few questions in advance because it it really gave me the chance to to, to think about uh, things I haven't considered for over twenty years. And you know, you, you have one thought, you have one memory, and it leads on to another and another, and it's you know eventually it's a bit like time traveling back in your own head, you know, so I kind of, I'm much more back in that mindset uh, now than I would otherwise have been. Otherwise it would have been, you know, a lot shorter and consider me mostly going, oh, I don't know. Um, so yeah, thanks in advance for the question. No worries. Not a problem at all. I, I realized that I haven't asked one question that I absolutely want to ask, which is um, about the space girls, which. Uh... <laughs> must you? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, of course you must. Yeah. It, it's become, a, along with um, things like Big Dave, it's become like a, a, um, a metaphor for a particular period of, of, uh, of 2000 AD. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's ungenerous to say it didn't quite achieve whatever <laughs> it said. Oh, it's extremely generous to say that, yeah. No, well, I mean, uh, uh, Space Girls was, it was kind of handed to me to write by, uh, by, by David in between, I think between the, the two series of uh, Mercy Heights and... Uh, and David had, had kind of um, come up with a general um, overview of the, of the series and, and written the first episode of um, Space Girls. By the way, for anybody um, lucky enough to be unfamiliar with the Space Girls, I mean, the, the, the concept is essentially uh, the Spice Girls in space. I mean, this, this was the 90s. Um, and it's, as, as a concept, it would have worked very well as perhaps a, a, a three-panel strip at the back of um, the Daily Star or something. But, I mean, obviously, it was never going to really um cut the mustard in in 2000 AD and I and I wasn't you know I wasn't blind to to, to its faults when uh, when David first gave it to me to write and I don't know why um he decided not to take it any further and he didn't have the time whether he just looked at it and thought uh, you know I am become death destroyer of worlds but um it was given to me to to write and I and I thought as as I always think uh, you know when I'm given um, a job as well, you know. Th- okay, this isn't great, but maybe I can make something of it. And uh, 
Well, I had going for me was um, Jason Brashill and the artist who, uh, if you've ever seen uh, Space, you know, the, the Simon Pegg series, all the artwork in that, all the Tim Busy artwork in that is either by Jason or um, Jim Murray. So, you know, he's a, he's a great artist. So I knew it was at least going to look good. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I mean, for one thing, it, it fell, fell foul of the, um, the, the the problem that I mentioned earlier with Big Dave, which is that strips that set out to make you laugh, um, you know, are generally poorly received because uh, no, nobody, uh, 2008 years anyway, don't really like that. They prefer laughs to be incidental. But the uh, the big problem with Space Girls was that it wasn't funny. And I, <laughs> and I did my damnedest with it, but it was kind of, you know, it was, it was, it was silly and it was, um, you know, kind of... Um, you know, sexist and um, and had very r- few redeeming features, really. And um, you know, I'd like to be able to to blame David for the entire Space Girls debacle. It was me who wrote the bloody thing. So, you know, I mean, and uh, perhaps you know, I mean, I, I prefer to remember that for some of the other things I've written. And in a, you know, in a in an aviary of uh, beautiful birds, there has to be the occasional clucking turkey. So, you know, <laughs> Space Girls was definitely mine. Yeah, and, well, let, let's, let's, let's talk about um, something slightly more pleasant, which is, as you've mentioned, is Mercy Heights, which, um, um, it, you know, 2008 had done, uh, tried to do um, kind of a Space Hospital before with Hilary uh, Robinson's um, Medifact 318. Um, this, I believe, was uh, more inspired by your kind of Babylon 5, you know, big epic but with lots of kind of soap opera elements within it yeah no it was inspired by three things um really i mean one was uh, was babylon five which is the obvious um, comparison and the other one was a uh, er of which i was a was a big fan at the time and um and and i mean medivac was was sort of a an inspiration um, because um you know I mean, I uh, I haven't looked at it for a while, but you know, I, I, it certainly didn't plumb the depths of appalling cruelty and barbarism that I'd come to expect from 2008. It seemed far too kind of kindly and uh, you know, and, and sort of uh, you know, almost benign um, for, for 2008. So I, I wanted to, to to bring back some of the blood and gore. So that was one thing. But the, the main um, thing that inspired me was uh, was the pit, which was John Wagner had come back to to. To Judge Dredd, and uh, one of the, the, the first one of the earliest things he did after his long sabbatical was um, this kind of um, interlocking um, narrative, which I think it crossed over with um, the magazine as well. But it was like a, a multi-part epic, uh, multi-character epic about a corrupt sector house, and uh, you know that whole idea of judging, uh, juggling an epic storyline with a big cast of characters. Uh, you know that really appealed to me because I'd seen how it had worked um, so well in the pit. So uh, it, it was uh, it was just a combination of those things, I suppose, that, that inspired Mercy Heights. And um, yeah, one of the things again, uh, one of the things I really had going for me was uh, was Kev Walker, who was um, you know quite rightly has uh, made a lot of money over the years uh, designing hardware for films, and you know also worked on the Judge Dredd movie. But uh, he designed um, the, the Mercy Heights space station, he, and he did a lovely kind of three D version of it. You could twirl around on screen, and I still think you know it's it looks good even now, and it, it, to, to my mind, it looks even better than Babylon Five. So, uh, and he just, he designed all the characters as well. I mean, I had. Uh, um, the, the, the character I initially had in mind um, as, as a sort of a background character was the uh, the, the hospital administrator, a character called the Sahitu. I described in the script as like having um, tight, um, dark fur, like a panther, and like you know, kind of a myriad of eyes at the front of his head. But uh, the way um, Kev drew him was absolutely nothing like that. He had this kind of very lofty patrician look, and it, and it definitely affected the way I, uh, I, I wrote the, uh, the, the the character. And he had this this kind of weary, weary kind of oh god, do I have to? And not her again. And you know, it, uh, he, he became my favourite character largely out of uh, because of the way Kev designed him. And you know, I, I could look at this three D thing he designed at the station, think, well, okay, the shuttle could go in there. You know, they could be tapped there. And you know, the artwork really inspired um, the, the, the strip. So you know. I mean, it's also uh, it's, it's a murder mystery, and I, you know, I, I still like to think even now that you can't really guess who the killer is until the last or the last few episodes. And I, I think I managed to pull that off okay. So, uh, Mercy Heights, in terms of things I've written, that's one of the things I'm still uh, still most proud of. 
Well, there was um, uh, one of the things that, that always uh, don't use the word plagues, but is, is a feature of a lot of 2080 stories is, is changes in in artists and and you know Mercy Heights had a, a few artists on it. Do you think that had an effect on the on the strip? Well, it did, but I think it had a beneficial effect. You know, I mean, I, I, I'd absolutely love for Kev to have drawn the whole of the first series, but um, he got sort of um, um, hijacked by uh, by John Wagner, who wanted him to draw um, a strip, the Balls Brothers, um, which um, you know was 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 actually a humour strip that was quite well received, and uh, you know, and Kev always described the script as uh, piss funny, and you know, he. Uh, he couldn't wait to draw it. And, uh, you know, I couldn't uh, very well say, you know, no, stay, draw more Mercy Heights. So I, I was given them um, Andrew Curry. Andrew Curry took over for the, the second um, batch of episodes and he brought something different to it because it was much more kind of um, shadow and kind of a gloomy brooding atmosphere. And that worked particularly well with them. Um, there was a kind of a, an ancient mystic kind of ascetic kind of figure in it called uh, Lin Haris, which no one has ever picked up on this, but, but he was, he was basically cursed to doom in the future. And that was always who, who I had in mind when first when I described the character and also when I was writing him. And, um, and although I never said that to Andrew Curry either, it was like he got it, you know, he drew a brilliant uh, Lin Haris, not that there was anything wrong with Kebs. So, um, you know, that was, I was really pleased with that when it started coming in. And, uh, after that, the last few episodes were written by um, Lee Sullivan, who um, I've worked with before on the, the Marvel UK stuff. And uh, I mean, again, a, a bit like Kev Hopgood, he has an absolutely, um, you know, fantastic approach to storytelling. I mean, his, 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 you know, his stories flow perfectly. You never have to wonder which panel comes next or what's going on. And uh, you know, he, he brought all that as well as a kind of quite open Kev Walker-like style to the artwork. So, you know, they, they all brought something different. And I've never thought of it as a drawback to the, the, the strip, you know, because I mean, Dread has a, a, a changing cast of, 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 of artists, well, not writers, but artists, and, uh, you know, Sinister Dexter. I mean, any strip that's been running for a while has to, to juggle different art teams. So I don't really, hello, uh, Santa Luz Kev, I don't even, I don't recall it being a problem. And in the second series, I had. Um, uh, Neil Gooch, who I think he's, you know, he's since gone to, to, to great things in the, in America. Trevor Hare signed, drew the first few episodes, did a lovely job on those. And then I, I got Lee back again. So, um, no, it was, um, it, it, the art was, uh, the, the changing art, that roster of artists was ever a problem for me. I, I always thought they, you know, they all brought something different. I, I'm guessing it wasn't part of the original plan to have Tor Cyan spin off and uh, essentially be. Rogue Trooper. Yeah, well, well, what what happened with that was I went to a meeting with um, uh, David Bishop and Andy Diggle, who had uh, you know joined the company by then, and um, and I was I was going to pitch the uh, the third series of Mercy Heights, which would have been about a, a, a psychiatric facility, which was the, the third um, station in them. Um, the Mercy Heights fleet, and it was where the, the criminally insane of the galaxy go to die. And uh, like the, the big dandy of the inmates was this phenomenally powerful entity whose, whose intellect had, had sort of warped the uh, the reality of the station itself. So it uh, became this, this kind of Hieronymus Bosch landscape, although, you know, it, it that became gradually apparent as the series evolved. And, uh, you know, I had, I had quite um, sort of um, high hopes for that. But... Um, Andy and and David said almost immediately, well, you know, we we don't like the soap aspect of Mercy Heights. It, it's not really a good fit for 2000 AD, which, you know, to be honest, I, I couldn't uh, argue with. Um, and you know, I, I put those in originally because it's it's another staple of hospital dramas, and it? it just seemed to flow naturally naturally from the material, but was not you know you know all that soppy loving kissing stuff. You know, it's, it's not really um, you know it doesn't really fit with two thousand AD. So they didn't like that, but what they did like was was Tor Cyan, and they uh, they asked me to write Tor Cyan. Um, a limited series instead, and uh, and the big inducement for that was that I had Kev Walker back as the artist to draw it. So, uh, you know, it, I'd be lying if I didn't immediately think, um, you know, but don't you see, you know, it's going to be Friday all over again. People are just going to want to know is he rogue trooper? I and mean, we always or, already had a few um, letters in like that while Mercy Heights was running. But uh, you know, you don't turn down a chance to work for uh, work with Kev Walker or write a strip for for, for two thousand AD. So again, I thought, well, okay, well, we'll just hope that doesn't happen. In the meantime, I'll get on with writing the story, and. Uh, and of course, it um, it did in the end. I mean, he was never intended to be um, 
um, uh, rogue trooper. But um, but but I thought if he was completely um, divorced from rogue, rogue trooper and had nothing to do with him, it would be it would kind of feel like a cheat for the reader. So I kind of came up with the idea that he was cloned from Rogue's original biochip, and. Um, and this was only really um, revealed towards the end of the last few uh, series. So he was uh, he was kind of like a, a distant clone of Rogue Troop in the in the, um, in the interim period that the chip had got damaged and uh, you know several other kind of weird misshapen and uh, distorted clones had also appeared and Cyan had to battle those. But uh, that was how I uh, addressed the, um, the the question of him being Rogue or not. And I also uh, one of the things that was was great was that for, as a one-off story for a special, um, I got to write a road trooper story that um, that Dave Gibbons drew, and I brought um, Torsion into that as a character. So you know, it was very clearly established as Rogue had done this, it was this character, and had done that, and Torsion was yes, um, related to it, was but very different, very definitely something else. Although you know, the history of the bioship wasn't revealed immediately. So, so yeah, it, well, he wasn't originally intended to be um, to be a rogue um, clone, and um, I mean, I think why Torsion didn't get any further because I mean, by by the end of the the, the 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 run of writing that, I'd got to the point where I kind of I felt that I knew the character almost, you know, like Dread. I could put him down in any any situation and uh, know what he was going to do, how he was going to react, and I wasn't high bang by all that um, continuity. And well, Rogue Trooper would never do this, so. Uh, you know that was uh, that was what I was I was doing with it, but um, you know I think Matt Smith had taken over as editor by that point, and he thought probably quite rightly, as the readers also did. Well, why have a character who, to all intents and purposes, is Rogue Trooper when you could just have Rogue Trooper? So <laughs> it was Matt who said, uh, "Well, okay, yeah, right, um, write another series, but uh, but kill him off. You know, I want him dead. I want him convincingly dead by the end." And I mean, he said it. You know, you know, Matt. He said it a lot more politely and diffidently than that but that was the uh, you know that that was the message so uh, and that, that was what I did and I kind of you know to, to make sure he was convincingly dead I effectively banged the whole planet off him by the end of the last story but then on the very last page you see this kind of shadowy figure creeping towards the cenotaph on, on New Earth and this kind of heavily bandaged hand <laughs> places a cracked and distorted um, uh, biochip on the uh, on, on the altar and you know if, if the camera had pulled out he'd have been had a, you know a drip and an eye and lung as well but the uh, the, the hint was that uh, yeah yeah Torsai is dead but he isn't really even so in his, his character arc had come to a very a very natural end so you know if that was uh, I like to think he's still not dead but if, uh, since that was the last story I think he uh, you know he, he went out fighting oh uh, yeah, something else I want to say about Torsai because I um in the end, I mean, the whole idea was of him being, a, you know, a member of the Mercy Heights crew was that he had this kind of long history as a, as, as a, essentially a killer, you know, a hired murderer, and he was trying to atone for his misdeeds. You know, whereas uh, once he might have blown aliens to pieces, now he's involved in the, in sewing them back together. So you know, I had him as a kind of a almost a pacifist character, and Kev always hated that because um, he just wanted him out there kicking ass. Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, artists they love to draw action above all else and it was never my intention to have um tor science sitting around uh, you know weaving wicker baskets and arranging dried flowers I and mean, he was always going to end up fighting people but uh, my, my kind of uh, concept of the character was uh, was like essentially Kwai Chang Kane. I mean, you're probably too young to remember Kung Fu, the TV series, but it was, uh, it was a series running when I was a kid devised by Bruce Lee, although the character was eventually played by David Carradine, who was, uh, you know, he could kill you with a single blow, but he was also, uh, you know, a, a, an avowed pacifist, a pacifist who would drift from town to town every episode. And, uh, you know, and he would start out saying uh, things like uh, fear is the enemy, the only enemy, and vengeance is a hole with a bucket, a, a bucket with a hole that can never be filled. And, you know, I mean, you could, there's a whole website out there with, uh, with Kung Fu TV series philosophy, much of it made up on the hoof, not genuine Eastern philosophy at all. And, you know, you just feel so much wiser and more intelligent at the end of an episode of Kung Fu. But um, the main thing was that uh, he always ended up beating up a disorderly queue of thugs at the end of... Um, uh, 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 you know, throughout the course of an episode, and that was my um, 
concept for Tor Sion that he would be provoked beyond endurance and then eventually he would he would kick ass. But uh, Kevin Andy just wants him kicking ass all the time. So there was um, there was a kind of creative tension that arose uh, over that, and uh, you know Kev would uh, would send these great long screeds about where he thought the story should go, and uh, you know Sion's whining again at this point. Why can't he do this instead? And um, Andy even though wrote in an extra balloon in one of the stories that I didn't write, in which, um, uh, you know, the kind of a phantom version of Rogue as, as part of Sion's hallucination says, says to him, um, you know, oh, this, this kind of self-torturing, um, you know, navel-gazing bullshit, that's not who you are. And I thought, well, actually it is, Andy. But uh, you know, at, at that point, uh, you know, I, I didn't really have any choice in the matter. So, you know, that led to a story in which eventually, yes, yeah, Sion is provoked beyond uh, his, his endurance and ends up killing somebody for the first time. And, uh, and he's, he's kind of, he's, he's lost his way at that point. He doesn't know who he is anymore. He's not even the pacifist he tried to become. And he had, you know, in order to find himself again, he has to get back to new earth and reconnect with, uh, you know, with, with who he was. But, um, uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, the, the fact that uh, we all had different ideas to the character probably worked out well from him in the end. But of course, they were always going to bring back uh, Rogue, and you know, I, I have no problem with that. Um, what was the motivating factor in your decision to to leave editorial in two thousand AD? Well, um, the decision was uh, was uh, it wasn't my decision. It was um, it was taken out of my hands, and it was it was born out of the change in management. The fact that uh, you know they weren't. Uh, particularly keen on having a freelance editor on 2080. And they had um, David, who, you know, is, is one of the, the, the best editors in 2080 history, is still heavily involved with um, Dread and 2080 law. And, uh, you know, there was no better sort of um, successor to take over, really. Plus, he was on staff. So, um, no, it was, um, it was management who, uh, who made the decision to kind of move me aside and put um, – and, and put, install Dave as a new Tharg. And, you know, I was a bit disgruntled at first. I mean, I still think it's the best editing 2080 is the best job in, in British comics. I mean, there are a lot fewer British comics around now, but then, and certainly before then, it, it really was. And, um, but, you know, as, as I've also said, I mean, it's not like it'd been sent to the salt mines. I mean, editing um, the, the magazine is pretty cool as well. And, um, Lawman of the Future had been cancelled by that point. So I had a few issues I had to put together and, um, and, and send out. So that was uh, that and the magazine that were very much um, because David had commissioned so far ahead, it was an absolute doddle to to edit. All the strips were there. I just had to get them edited, uh, so, and then lettered, um, commissioned covers, write cover lines and, and, and get the, the whole thing off to production. And plus it was a monthly uh, magazine, was, was a monthly 2000 ADs a weekly. So it was, um, it was so, so much easier than working on 2000 AD. And there, there were definite pluses, but... Uh, no, I was. Um, it was never. Um, it, it was never really gonna gonna last. And uh, and I was uh, at one point. I was taken aside by uh, by management and asked if I'd take a, a, a cut in my uh, in my freelance um, rate, which uh, you know certainly wasn't an inflated one. It was very much the industry standard at the time. I thought, well, where is this um, leading? If I give into this, then you know. Uh, my children will be next, so I just said, "Well, no, I'm not very, I'm not very keen on that idea." So, uh, so no, and I walked out of there knowing that uh, you know my card was marked and the writing was on the wall. So when the, when the axe fell, I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't greatly surprised, and uh, I mean it seemed like an enormous, uh, a, a great disaster at the time because it was, uh, you know, it was, as I said, the greatest job in comics, and I and I love the, uh, the the years that I spent working on it, but. Um, and if, if I hadn't left when I did, I wouldn't have then gone on to uh, Panini Comics, which is what Marvel UK became. And I met many of the people who are still my friends, which led on to four years at the BBC, which, you know, who wouldn't want to work at the BBC? And, um, and eventually on to Eagle Moss, where uh, I worked for longer than I worked anywhere and where I met my wife so you know i can't complain i mean it might uh, it, it might have seemed like a disaster at the time but as, as with many things in life with the you know the, the hindsight with hindsight and perspective and being able to take and see the bigger picture then you were uh, you know you, you see it had to happen i the, the 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 1990s is seen as a very difficult time in 2080 history and and you know sometimes people can go a bit overboard and 
uh, you know. Oh, well, there, goes, there goes my light again. I've, I've uh, retreated <laughs> into silhouette mode. Oh, and there I am again. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it, 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 it can turn into, oh, it was on its last legs and, and um, you know, uh, uh, lots of blame being thrown around. But I, I wanted to, to, to get your perspective, your hindsight on this, this, this period about um, what, what you think of when you think of your time at 2000 AD, whether it was a difficult time or whether those challenges were, were, were met and things were, as far as you were concerned, in a good place. Well, it, it was a very um, difficult time for uh, for all the reasons we, we we've talked about. You know, I had the change of uh, management to contend with, and I also had uh, the, the the draw full of um, you know kind of substandard strips that I had to uh, to, to to kind of um, sort of move through the the prog in one form or another, and uh, and and very limited opportunity in which to you know commission strips that uh, you know I would personally have commissioned and, and make the the comic my own, and that's one thing I didn't really get the chance to do, which was to make 2000 AD my own. I mean, I think if I'd um, been able to stay, um, I would have, um, you know, I'd like to have um, commissioned a few more original um, strips, worked with, um, you know, certain um, writers, and perhaps with any luck, I might have um, come up with a few more uh, Sinister Dexters or, or Nikolai Dante's, or even, uh, you know, Vector 13, which was, uh, you know, a very big hit, albeit a short-term one. And on the subject of Vector 13, I mean, the... Uh, Initial concept of that came from uh, from Al McKenzie, who uh, you know, although much maligned, maligned by a certain section of, um, of fandom, um, you know, had a very good instinct um, for, for for certain things, and that was one of them. And he, he originally uh, submitted it as an outline called uh, Section Thirteen, and uh, you know, I, I changed it to to Sector Thirteen. And then in one day, uh, Steve McManus was just wandering by, and he, he kind of mispronounced it as Vector Thirteen. I thought. Oh, that sounds good. So, you know, that was what it became. And uh, I mean, I, I think where um, Vector 13 sort of um, exceeded its brief was when um, David um, took over the editorial. And, uh, you know, David is, is well known as, uh, um, as, as not being a great fan of Tharg and uh, you know, wanted to uh, sort of um, get rid of him in an ideal world. But um, in order to kind of, uh, you know, create a kind of transition period, I suppose, he, uh, he had 2000 AD taken over by the men in black um, for a few issues. And, and it was only then that he discovered just just how much um, the readers truly loved Tharg and how, you know, how, how what, what a, a big and integral part of the comic he was. For all, he's just this silly green alien with a rosette on his head. He's, he is the soul of 2000 AD. And, uh, you know, as I, I, I said at the time, uh, nobody is bigger than the big green guy. So um, he, he was eventually forced to, to bring Tharg back. And, uh, you know, and quite rightly, I think he's, uh, he's still there now. Oh, by the way, I might not get another chance to do this, so I'm just going to show you my uh, my leaving card uh, drawn by uh, Cliff Robinson, in which uh, Tharg appears, as does Judge Dredd, and uh, you know, still a treasured possession. Uh, John, best wishes for the future, Cliff. Thanks for the work. <laughs> so uh, you know that that's something I uh, I'm, I must definitely get framed and put up on the wall at some point. Brilliant. Well, I, I I feel like I've taken way too much of your time, considering we're we're, we're knocking on the door of the three hour mark. Um, so I think I'll three hours. <laughs> well, I haven't really been looking at the clock, but as, <laughs> as I said, I have a, a tendency to blur. Uh, can I ask for one one more um, moment of your time? I just like to. Uh, this is allowed or not, but he is um, a, a, you know a respected two thousand eighty writer. The new novel by Robbie Morrison. Edge of the Grave, which is kind of described as uh, the Untouchable meets Peaky, the Untouchables meets Peaky Blinders, and is uh, you know a fantastic uh, crime drama and mystery set in 1930s Glasgow. So uh, available now in in, in hardback, uh, audio book, and uh, in Kindle format. Um, uh, read it; you won't be disappointed. Who am I to resent uh, a little bit of marketing? Super stuff. Thank you so much to John for such a, a nice long chat. I hope you enjoyed that. Earthlets will be back in a week's time for more from the Galaxy's Greatest Podcast. We're going to keep doing the weekly podcasts, uh, even though things seem to be opening up uh, a little bit. Try and, uh, you know, get through this all together. Um, but until next time, Earthlets, we'll see you in a week. Stay safe. Take care of one another. And splendid the thick. Alert.
Alert! Alert! Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.